go in here. All right, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, first uh, thing is to review and approve the agenda. Um, there had been some discussion. Not, there was not much no discussion. So, someone had suggested to me that we, um, since Ashley Hill is not here, that uh, she was particularly interested in the um, item number 12, uh, the Social Economic Equality Committee. Um, I think we can have a conversation about it and see if we want to take some steps forward there. So I'm inclined to leave it unless people feel um, we want to wait. Um, another thing, too, to consider is that, again, Ashley's not here, and we are scheduled to do committee appointments. She, she did tell me, um, you know, sign me up for whatever, which... Perfect. One committee does no one want? Great. I think I do it for one. Okay. Uh, so, um, what, do you, what are your thoughts on keeping or leaving that one? Uh, Donna? Well, I, I already had my bias. I would really like us to discuss this within our retreat, but so I would rather us wait. You'd rather us wait. Other opinions about this? Are there things that we need to appoint? Um, well, I did notice um, I, the most updated list doesn't have Glenn on the uh, Building Appeals Committee, and we did make a motion on that, so if we can just update that one. To me, that's the that may have. Yeah. <laughs> sure. One that may actually have action. Uh, and our retreat is? Not for another month. Yeah. So are, are we? Yes, but How much trouble is it to take someone off a committee and put them back on? <laughs> Not hard. Um, is it possible to do the appointments tonight as needed and then come back to them at the retreat? Sure. Is that and acceptable? Was, was the issue for the retreat actually appointing people or the role of committees? And well, I think as a new board member, a council member, I was just surprised so early in my term right. we did a committees when I didn't know that much about committees and so I felt it would benefit everyone to have a more holistic view of the committees that's all yeah Seems fair. I, I guess maybe we should uh, keep it tonight and then revisit it at the retreat does that sound well, we can even visit it revisit it uh, next meeting if Ashley's here um, okay that sounds great if, if we can make a note of that just to have it on the agenda again just to or uh, maybe we can just touch base with Ashley and see how she feels about it. See where we get to. Okay, cool. I just wanted to make sure that we um, brought that up. So, um, forget the word for it, but we're going to consider, consider that without objection approved. There we go. Uh, and so, general business and appearances. So, this is time for uh, anyone from the public to uh, make a comment about any topic that is not on our agenda. So, if you would uh, please say your name and your street. And the first, I think it can be the first one to go. It's after you, so get your guys going. Uh, my name is Carrie Clement. I live on uh, Emmons Street in Montpelier, and I'm representing the uh, Montpelier Downsizing Group. So this mostly because there are two new members here, and I thought I would say something about what our group is. Um, we are about database of about 200 uh, <coughs> people who want to downsize into smaller homes, um, market rate primarily. Um, and would like to be able to request that a future agenda topic be um, market rate housing for, doesn't necessarily seniors, but that tends to be who our group is comprised of. <clears throat> also, we formed a um, smaller core group of about seven to eight households that are really pushing this forward, and they meet at my house, and you know, we meet pretty regularly, you know, maybe a couple weeks. So we're in the process of discussing forming an LLC, and being able to um, move this forward. Some of us may be able to come to future meetings if that is requested. Um, but anyway, so I'm requesting a future agenda piece. Thanks. Um, Carrie, can I ask you a question about sure. that? Um, do you have a preferred timeline for when you would want to see something? Uh, yeah, soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, this has been, this, this is going on for years uh, as a group. Um, we've had meetings at the library. We've had, um, you know, of the larger group. They've been also available through um, OCRA has filmed them. So this is something that is pretty critical for a lot of people, you know, who have wanted to downsize. We had a survey that um, we conducted, and they want to downsize between six months and three, four years. And every 
every year gets tighter and tighter so a lot of it is that there are a lot of um, affordable housing you know rentals and um, housing coming up and those with deep pockets you know they go to wake robin you know but those of us in the middle just don't have a whole lot available we wouldn't qualify for affordable um, but we still would like to remain in the city and uh, people who have moved out of city because they just don't have any options so thank you great thank you uh, Donna. a staff question related to that I had the survey because I was on your mailing list but did we have a, that copy distributed for the whole council I don't know if we do or not. We can I have a PDF. Yeah. I mean, I okay, because I would want all our new council members to get it. It was a very good survey. Could you just send that to me, Carrie? Sure. That'd be great. Sure. And then we can re send it out, put it in the weekly email. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you'd be in touch about scheduling an agenda item and what specifically we want to cover. Perfect. Well, and then, too, I would love that document to live in, in our Google Drive, something that we can and we've cover how to property, access. So yes. Maybe there's something that we can just going forward when we can actually reveal, you know, where we are with those. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Anybody else? Okay. All right, so consideration of the consent agenda. You just mentioned I, that I did fix the date on the minutes. Great, thank you. Uh, Donna? Don't we have a swearing in to do? Oh, that's I've already been sworn in. Oh, you've been sworn in. Oh, <coughs> I missed it. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, well, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you for that, Donna. Uh, so, uh, coming back to the consent agenda, um, is there a motion? Move the consent agenda. Second. Any discussion? No one wants to pull anything? Okay, no, no discussion? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, <laughs> All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So we have a series of appointments to make. Um, so the first one is to the, the MTIC, Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Um, and I believe for this one, we have, sorry? We have uh, one vacancy. Just one person applying. And one person applying. Anderson. We have a motion. Oh, is, is Ian here? Would you like to come up and introduce yourself? Sure. Tell us about your interest in this committee. So again, say your name and your Hi, street. Uh, my name is Ian Anderson. I live on Hill Street. I applied for the appointment to the Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Uh, pretty new to town, but have you know been interested in getting involved. I am a civil engineer by practice. I finished up a PhD at the University of Vermont in November. We've recently moved here to take a position at the Agency of Transportation. Um, so I have a bit of a background in transportation and just looking to get involved. Great, thank you. Any questions? Yeah, a motion. I'll make a motion to uh, nominate Ivan Anderson. Ian. 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 Excuse me. Second. For the discussion, on favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. <coughs> Great. Congratulations, Ian. Thank you for serving. Um, First Tuesday, six o'clock. <laughs> All right. Uh, the design review committee also has one slot. Um, Hannah Smith is seeking the appointment. Hi. So we have a motion. Or not. I'll make a <laughs> motion to appoint Hannah Smith. Second. Donna? I had a question about the terms, and I meant to do it before the, the last uh, appointment. In August, when we do the alignment of the Planning Commission, the one thing the Committee on Committees didn't yet get to was looking at the appointment dates and getting them all aligned. And when we reappoint someone to fill a position, they don't automatically get a two year, but they, so I'm just looking at all the dates on this committee and everybody is September, but this one, is there any way we can align this appointment up with September? I think with this one, you can. Um, this is not a, a charter driven. So the Planning Commission DRB were set by charter and we're waiting for that charter change to 
go through the legislature so we can actually do it. Um, I believe, and I probably, you might want to just make sure we're correct on this, but DRC, I think, is set by our own rules and procedures. Not, there's no terms in the chart, I don't think. So if there's not, then we can, we can set the dates of the terms. I just I don't know whether it's an ordinance amendment or a, so I'd like to get, do a little more research on the DRC terms, but okay. I believe you can do it. I can, I can so we should out. just leave it as it is for now and come I back would, to it. I would, and then we could always okay. amend it um, even at the next meeting. I'll make a note here to check on DRC terms. I don't think it's, you know, it's not going to be extensive to find this out, but I, I just wouldn't want you to do it on the fly. Yeah. I'm not really sure we have okay. it right. Okay. Um, any other questions or discussion? So, Donna, you're, you're happy? Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, all right. Uh, any, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> okay. Congratulations, Hannah. All right. The tree board. The tree board has three slots seeking appointment. Two uh, existing members, Abby Callahan and Lynn Wild, are seeking reappointment. And there's a vacant slot, and Janet Wormser is seeking the vacant slot. Is there a motion? And are any of them here? No, okay. Second. Great, any other discussion? It's the same thing about dates. Check on that one too. Okay, that's not just one of ours, it's some more of these. I think it is, but again, I just okay. like Okay, okay, so I won't bring it up again, we'll just check on the dates, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, actually, just one question about that. When when would we hear back about that? The, the next time we're making an appointment? We can do it next meeting, I think, and we can just read. Okay. We'll see what's involved. Okay. Great. Okay. We'll just make an administrative adjustment the next meeting. We can do that. If it's something longer, then we can come back with the process. Okay. Great. <clears throat> okay. So there's been a motion and a second. Um, for the discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And uh, Central Vermont Internet Board. And I know we have uh, a couple people here interested in that. Um, so uh, one possibility is, well, I, I guess what I'd say let's hear from, from you all if you would introduce yourselves and um, tell us about your interest in this. this uh, one regular seat and one alternate seat. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dan Jones, Northfield Street. I have, most of you know me, so, but you know me in a different context, which is through the sustainable Montpelier effort. Um, it turns out I have, in a few lifetimes ago, an experience of being a telecommunications person as well, and worked with the city of Boston doing the uh, cable franchise, and then worked for numerous cable companies and cities uh, d during the 80s uh, on new technology, et cetera, and along with trying to do a start up with uh, interconnecting cable companies. I have learned in that process a whole lot about the sort of legalities of franchise law, of the development of the technology. I don't profess to be a uh, engineer or a uh, expert in this in all ways, but I, as you know, I care deeply about sort of the sustainable future for the town. I think a communications uh, system would, especially for central Vermont, with some independence would be crucial to that, so that's why I'm putting my name forward on this. Uh, one other thing, too, I think you might want to have a check with the city attorney whether uh, our membership in EC Fiber should be uh, removed, because we seem to have, uh, we can't be a part of two unions, I believe, and EC Fiber has pretty much said they're not coming here anytime in the near future, so uh, I, I would recommend that we uh, get some clarity on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I have already looked into that issue and we can be members and I would ask that you consider maintaining the membership and serving as the bridge between EC Fiber and its successors. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Stephen Whitaker. And I've been at this for 24 years in telecommunications planning here. 
prior to that, I was climbing towers and building cable systems uh, in other parts of the country. Um, <coughs> communications Union District is a new law, a couple years old. Um, as soon as that law passed, I had been involved uh, in the White River Valley many years ago as a regional planning commissioner. And then as Central, as EC Fiber got successful, I attended a lot of those meetings with my friend Charlie Larkin. Uh, he has withdrawn his nomination for this spot due to health reasons. He's in his 80s now. But he was the telecom engineer with the Department of Public Service for many years. So some of what I would ask you to consider is that Montpelier, as the seat of state government and as a owner of a municipal heating system with fiber, unused fiber attached, uh, with a point of presence, it's called a fiber access point, FAP, at the Belco substation out on River Street, we are uniquely positioned to set statewide leadership. We can near-term bridge to CV fiber using that Belco interconnect. We can light up downtown buildings along the heat system. Uh, we will probably be lower priority in the 12 town district, or 12 and growing, uh, due to the fact that most all addresses in town are served by Comcast right now. But the addresses that can be commercial buildings, especially that can be interconnected with symmetric high-speed fiber, uh, could really set, set us into a, a, a new direction. The interplay, which I'm also involved with frequently with Paco and his work with uh, telecommunications planning for public safety, uh, You've seen a lot in the news lately about the wireless access points, uh, coverage co being disconnected. We could immediately prioritize the known dead zones and build fiber to those locations because we would not be uh, redundantly planning where tower coverage will be. So I've just been doing this a long time. I made the pitch to the Regional Planning Commission hoping that they could get this started two years ago. Uh, but their executive committee didn't run with it. They're going to wait till they rewrite the plan. So I'm glad that Montpelierites saw fit to join, to create one, uh, hitting the ground running uh, with uh, integrated planning along public safety, civic engagement. Uh, I won't go into the details about what we've, I've talked with the mayor and the city manager briefly about the use of that heat pipe fiber. Um, I'm open to questions. Should you see fit to appoint me, I would not only be keeping you well informed, I would be trying to get you more involved because there's a lot of work to do. We're a decade behind. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, so this is sort of an unusual um, uh, uh, appointment, particularly because uh, with this other board, it is also possible that a, a council person could be the, the representative on there as well. I mean, are there any other council people who who might want to be considered? If if not, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, well, I have the interest, if not the expertise. Uh, but when I looked, in, it's just one regular and one alternate. You know, usually, I guess if there were like two, I I don't know. I have some interest, but. Okay, at this late date. No, no, fair enough. That that makes sense. Um, well, I, particularly because we have an alternate position and a regular position, probably it makes sense to me that we should probably go into an executive session and and then come back out. Does that sound <coughs> good? Okay. Uh, Before yes. you, I have a non-executive session question, yes. which is I don't. Uh, I'm speaking not? to Mike. Yeah, you got to get close. Thank you. Yeah. Um, how many how many members are on this uh, on this committee and how many do we have compared to the other towns in the, in the group? My understanding is that it's one representative per town okay. in per municipality. Yeah, most of them, if not all of them, voted in March, and I think it's twelve. Um, 
the, the, it took it takes under under <coughs> under law it takes two towns to originally form the district. Any number of towns can move to join it on that same town meeting. Additional towns can join in a bilateral vote by vote of the select board, uh, and then in a vote of acceptance from the district of the vote to join. Also, because of the nature of because of the nature of the business. Um, the town is not funding this other than appointing uh, a representative, so it has to create a business and funding plan as its sort of first order of business. So where there are areas that might be opportunities, there also has to be the area of uh, figuring out who is going to actually uh, pay for this and how, where, you know, how the funding will uh, take place. Now, the, the towns almost universally within the Central Vermont District voted to say yes we want to be part of it in the town meeting this year now the question is how does it put together and how does it uh, get funded in such a way that it could actually do something as opposed to have good ideas so that is so it becomes almost more of a business proposition uh, to begin with rather than an operational problem and just for the new members um, info under the statute that allows these to be created it actually prohibits um, tax dollars from being put in um, that was it was uh, created the opportunity for communities to join for these things but did, did not for state or local tax dollars to prop them up so they, they can't we can't put the money in right. even if we chose to uh, all right so executive session is probably the thing I think um, so hopefully it won't take four hours <laughs> uh, so we know how to recess now. <laughs> would, it, would it help to have a one minute synopsis of what our the sister district does and customers and revenue and finance just so you know what we're getting into or does it matter? No. Doesn't matter at this point. I I don't well what's your um, I have a good understanding of it. Okay. I I'm feeling pretty good as well. Good. All right. Um but thank you. All right, so we have a motion. So if, uh, we got a site. Is it uh, Title thir consider, 313? Uh, it's the one, same one, to appointment of public official officer, 313. Yeah, I think it's 313, so appoint. Correct. You don't need Title to have a finding for that one. That's when you're allowed to go. Right. That we can go into executive session. So was that a motion? Yes. Okay. Second. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We'll be right back. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, great. So, I guess we'll start with the motion. I would like to make a motion that we make Dan Jones the appointed regular representative on Central Vermont Internet, and that we make Stephen Whitaker the alternate. Great. Th um, I'll second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great, thank you. Um, so especially since this is a new um, thing. Oh, we didn't we didn't specify the, the length of time. I didn't. Um, <coughs> I would move that we make the terms uh, for the uh, Central Vermont, what did we call it? Internet? <laughs> two, two things at once here. Central Vermont. Uh, Central Vermont Internet Board uh, appointees from Montpelier to be a one-year term. Second. For the discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, so, especially since this is uh, a new venture for us, I mean, we're, we're excited about it and looking forward to to hearing back from you. You know how it's going, and you know, hoping that it's a really positive, uh, collaborative relationship with them. So, and do you have? A, how how often would you like a uh, report back? Um. Especially given that it's new, um, I would think on the scale of like every three months or so. I mean, hopefully, does that sure. sound? It, or it is, is there a significant? You know, as community, as, is yeah. there a significant? And it doesn't need to be like you know coming to the council, but even if it's something that we can put in in the council, um, city manager, or mayor's report, or whatever, um, that would be useful. Sure. Yeah, we we receive a written report from the city manager every week. On Friday, and this would be a wonderful place to have a written update. Yes. Okay, it doesn't need to be in this setting. So. Okay. Okay. Great. Unless there's thank action. You. Great. All right. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
and uh, green up day. Hmm. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm just hand those out. I'm just taking one. Good evening. Um, my name is Nate Hausman. I'm a Montpelier Live board member, uh, and I also help coordinate uh, Montpelier Live's Green Up Day efforts. And um, I know since we have some new city councilors, um, I thought I'd sort of apprise those who don't know a little bit about Green Up Day and also uh, tell you about one new element that we're adding this year that I, I think would be helpful. Um, so, um, in case you're not familiar with it, Green Up Day is an annual statewide effort. It brings over uh, 22,000 volunteers from around the state to pick up uh, litter from the roadways and public areas around the state. Um, it's been happening since the 1970s. Uh, in Montpelier, we have a robust effort. Uh, it's coordinated uh, through Montpelier Live, and, uh, and really the way it works is that um, that we have provide bags uh, for volunteers to use to collect litter uh, at the Montpelier Farmers Market. So they can come down, they can pick up bags, they can pick up gloves, and they can be assigned or, or claim a stretch of, of roadway or a public project. There's some other projects that happen around town. It happens to coincide. This year it's it's May 5th, so it happens to coincide with, with well, it actually annually coincides with uh, Montpelier's May Fest. So that's the event where um, three Penny does a Montpelier, there's a pie breakfast, it's the first outdoor farmer's market, there's a lot of events and hubbub around town. So, um, so as part of that, we do, we do Green Up Day, and, uh, and, and as I mentioned, people can come down to the farmer's market, they can pick up supplies, and they can get assigned um, uh, uh, an area to green up. They can also pick up um, some, a coupon sheet that has goodies from local businesses that they can redeem um, from, from around town as well. Uh, bags can be left uh, curbside uh, across town. Uh, the good folks at, at the Department of Public Works pick those up on the Monday, typically, or, or the following week after Green Up Day. Um, in addition to, to uh, coming down to pick up bags at the farmer's market, or if you're not able to, you can pick up bags at the city clerk's office in advance of Green Up Day. Um, and, uh, and that's really, well, and also I should say there's some corporate groups because we have a, um, a large corporate community, there's some corporate groups that green up the Friday before Green Up Day. Um, but uh, part of the coordination, one of the challenges with coordinating the event is that it's sometimes people are greening up and we're not aware of it. So to help us sort of coordinate efforts and not be duplicative and also track how many volunteers and how many bags, we're rolling out a new app or an online mapping tool. And you can see a URL in the sheet I just handed you. Um, but the idea is it's only going to be effective if we roll it out on a, on a widespread basis. And so the idea is that I just wanted to sort of inform you and apprise you of that um, so you can help spread the word. We'll also make these sheets available at the city clerk's office when folks come, and we'll have them down at the farmer's market. But, um, but I just wanted to briefly leave it there and uh, see if you have any questions about the day. Does this mean that there will no longer be giant maps and everybody write their name on the road and they're picking? <laughs> I understand the practicality of the app, but that has a, a space in my heart for the uh, <laughs> tradition. I remember as a little kid, you know, writing my name on a street in, in my hometown. Um, so I'm just a little sad. <laughs> but I understand no, why we I, I appreciate the nostalgia. No, it, it, it just is hard because people are collecting, as I said, sure. in advance and greening up sometimes that doesn't happen at the day of. And so this will allow us in real time to coordinate and track those volunteers. So I think it'll be more effective if, um, if it, we'll, we'll also probably have a paper version. And I know I'm keeping track um, uh, non-electronically as well for the corporate groups anyhow. Good. So does that mean that because my ultimate Frisbee team has an, uh, a tournament on that day that we could go before or after and this app would help us like pick a place to go? Correct. Yeah. And I should say, just as an example, that's a great, that's a great example. No. And I know you did that. Your team did that last year and I really appreciated that. Um, and, and just as an example too, if there are particular projects, so 
Green Up Day, while we embrace picking up litter, there are other projects happening around town. I know there's an installation going in at the North Branch. I know there's going to be some um, beds being planted around um, City Hall. So there's some other efforts. And if you have particular efforts, I've, I've put an email out to the, the, the tree board folks. If there are other efforts that you'd uh, like help with that you think would be in the public interest, I'd be certainly willing to, uh, to take those as well. Thank you so much. Excellent. Green Up Day is one of my favorite days in Vermont. Thank you, Nate. <laughs> yeah. For the new council members, Nate is also Mr. Skating Rink. <laughs> yes, so grateful for that, too. He <laughs> works it's, hard. It's now gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he says it was a big grind. <laughs> OK, we're up to uh, the police department presentation. You're going to need a second? Huh? You just to hook up the top here. So. Sure, yeah, but maybe we can take a, a little five minute break here while Tony sets up. Do you have a sign? Okay. Okay, so we're. All right, this is the. License ordinance? This is the John is an idiot. <laughs> no. Oh, it is. This is, um, this is, I'm going to. I'm going to blame my being my first term at the time, and I didn't know what was going on. I was, I was young and naive. Um, uh, we had we went through at, at my own uh, uh, encouragement. Uh, we went through a couple rounds of conversations about the crazy licenses, and when when Rosie brought up the screwy ordinances, and it was like the license, I was like, oh no no, those are all out of date. Well, I did back through the minutes. Turns out they weren't out of date. We went through and made two rounds of it at the time, and we, we took sort of the first wave out, and then there was, we came back to it, and there were some different requests that came from the council that I was supposed to get back to the council with something more formal about, and it got put off and put off and put off for months, and it went into oblivion. And um, Somewhere along the line, I decided that they must have magically happened because I've been acting as though they have. I've been, you know, bragging about how I was, you know, responsible for getting rid of the dry cleaners ordinance. What a ridiculous thing that was. And we, in fact, still technically require a license for anyone who would want to come in out of town to have their dry cleaning done in Montpelier. <laughs> Uh, that was, in fact, the very license that inspired me to say, let's go through these. So anyways, what I have here is a list of the things that we were supposed to come back to, minus the dry cleaning ordinance. I'd love to get rid of that, too. But these are the, but there was some concern about environmental contamination or something, so that got sort of left hanging. But if, if I had come back, and this was largely um, Tom Galanka who had wanted some other changes, this is what would have come next. Uh, it would have included an addition, you see in the thing I printed out there, of section 912, which is sort of an odd place to put it, but it's where you want to put it, um, requiring that a, a license fee schedule just gets approved annually by the city council, taking it out of the ordinances entirely, which I actually think is probably a pretty good idea. And then all the repealings that you see underneath are those sections of those license ordinances that set the rate. So that way, all the sort of hardwired license rates are out. There's a license fee schedule understanding up there that I would just bring to sort of reapprove, re review. And then a couple of the licenses that had gotten added in at my request were then supposed to be pulled out, again at my request, just because the circumstances around them had changed and they seemed needlessly punitive. So all that stuff just literally never happened. So. I just wanted to run this by you all, see if it's still something that the council, even though it's a completely different council, would like to do. And I hope you'd also be interested in getting rid of the dry cleaner license. And I could draw it all up as a proposed ordinance change and just start throwing it at you all next time because it's, it's pretty goofy and it's pretty embarrassing that I dropped the ball and then told myself I hadn't. <laughs> so questions, thoughts, concerns about this? So the dry cleaner license is what? That someone <laughs> someone who doesn't live in Montpelier and brings their clothes into Montpelier to? Well, the dry cleaner is supposed to have a license. And then you're supposed to come and get a license from my office if you're from outside of town and you want to have your dry cleaning done in town. 
I didn't even see that one. Yeah, was, yeah, it's right up, <laughs> it's right up there with the uh, you know the the dairy ordinance that we did get rid of. Um, that that one yeah. did manage to make the cut there, but uh, yeah, yeah. So it's I mean you know, and there was also one that was discussed around back and forth was the blacksmith one, and I was actually the one who encouraged that to stay in because I was like you know that could be kind of a boutique kind of thing somebody might want to do and that could be a massive crazy fire hazard if somebody wanted to and we might want to license it you know so that was the, that was the other odd one but you know whatever you all you all make the rules i just you know type things <laughs> oh, Rosie. Just confuses. So, <laughs> i'm very much in favor of doing this um i would encourage you when you bring it back so so i assume we have to go through the normal process we've got to have two um hearings yes i was just looking for guidance on um so when we do that i would simultaneously like to adopt the fee schedule so that we're not operating for a while without fees um, right so i guess I guess if we're going to do it in the order of operations, I guess we would probably have to do that immediately after a second reading yeah. was passed. Well, we could do it in the next meeting because it wouldn't go into effect for another 15 days after second reading was passed. So that would theoretically put it to the next meeting. So the next meeting, you could just approve it. That would probably be the order of operations. But the hearings just will propose the changes along with the proposed piece of schedule. Make sure yeah. that <coughs> sync up. Okay, well, the fee schedule wouldn't be part of an ordinance change, though. Rosie's suggesting so, is that we approve that at the same time we do yeah, the and the second reading. so we have new fees in place or the same fees. Okay, well, I'm just saying they wouldn't, the change Except wouldn't affect for two weeks. Yeah. Right, yeah. so, but that's yeah. in place. Is there any more on that, Rosie? No, nope, okay. that would. Okay. Good. Dry cleaner up down. Well, okay, down, so I'm gonna down. I'm gonna put in my my two cents here, uh, which is that I, I think it does not make sense to require a license from somebody out of town to get their dry cleaning done in town. That does not make sense to me. But I do I would like to see uh, dry cleaners continue like the that operation uh, continue to be licensed just because it does you know it has the potential to use some um, pretty gnarly. Um, chemicals that should there, you know, kind of like the issue with the blacksmith, right? Like if if something were to happen, like we want that paper trail and we want to make sure that they're doing their due diligence. Um, and I would actually also make the same case for uh, gas stations. Oh, gas stations. So um, I would like, those are the two that I, I would, I mean, I might be in the minority, I could get outvoted, that's fine. Uh, but those are, um, those are the two that I would want to retain of all of those that are listed. Uh, well, well, I mean, you're the chemist. Uh, versus <laughs> listing know. those specific, what if you made the general heading that things that dealt with certain chemicals or potential, do you, do you have to name the producer, such as the cleaner, the gas station, or is it the, the businesses that deal with certain products that are I, in potentially endangered? I think naming chemicals that we want to prohibit is or, or, the, be, or the characteristic no okay or, I don't think there's okay. I don't think there's any okay. way to really effectively do that or enforce it or um, I think um, the only thing I would mention as far as the potential pushback is part of the reason when I got here I just sort of mm -hmm. realized these things were here is that the gas station license the dry cleaner license don't, doesn't look like they had been enforced in in decades so i will be going to them for the first time in you know 50 years and saying hey guess what you owe us money so you might get some pushback on that my understanding is that the dry cleaner that's in in town that's uh, you know at very in maine that's not actually a dry cleaner it's just drop it, a dropping off point right so oh i don't know my that's my understanding of that yes so it's, a, it's a drop off I, because it's a drop off i would guess that they well, I don't know. I mean, does, is that covered by I, dry cleaners? I would guess not, but yeah. It sounds like this is a discussion we should have in the discussion on whether to repeal that yes. ordinance. I'll, I'll so build I'm something for you all to bounce off Thank of, you. and then you can. <laughs> <laughs> you can give John the go ahead to, to do this, and we'll have well. two hearings. Okay. And you didn't get anything else from us, right? Nah. Okay. How are you doing? We're good. Okay, great. So back to <laughs> police department presentation. Great, I'm going to move. <laughs> so first off, this is our plug. We run Apple products in the cruisers. <laughs> so. Wait a second. Oh, sorry, you need that? No, that's good. Flash. 
good. Yeah, you, I'll tell you, okay. We're good. Oh, well, yeah, actually, so thank you. <laughs> Sorry. So this is our last meeting. We just did the real quick one on that. And this is the first of our department presentations to try to get everyone acquainted with functions of the department. As you know, we all took, except for Jack, took a tour of the police department last Wednesday. You may have forgotten that. There were lots happened after that tour, but we did spend an hour with the police chief. And um, this is really the follow-up walkthrough and a chance to have an open conversation about department issues. We'll be doing these uh, systematically. Next meeting will be DPW, which is why we're scheduling the tour for next week. Okay. With that, I turn over to Chief Aikens. All right. Well, thank you all for the opportunity. It's, this is going to be, uh, we're going to start off with like a 10,000 foot view, but we can, if there's any questions uh, at any time, uh, by all means, uh, you know, um, we'll, I'll try to address them as best I can. And the, and the, the main point is um, to, to take away from tonight's presentation is, first of all, Montpelier is still an incredibly safe and very healthy community. So even though things that I focus on sometimes are the darker side of, of social challenges, um, you know, from, from crime to, to even potential terrorism to opiate addiction, all those things, uh, but overall, Montpelier is doing very, very well. So uh, we'll start off with the uh, just our organiza organizational chart. Next one, Bill. You have the. You have the have oh, you, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just have. The okay. Uh, uh, you can see that, but our authorized strength uh, right now is 16 police officers. We currently have uh, a vacancy that we have been, we've identified the candidate, uh, but that vacancy was, came about last June uh, when an officer uh, left our agency for another agency up in the northern part of the state. And it just, so one of the challenges there, it highlights how long it takes to identify uh, a police officer candidate. And then this, this person, um, and uh, she is actually currently has been a, a dispatcher with us. She is a level two part-time police officer uh, with another community, but she is the one that we've identified as the next full-time Montpelier police officer. So she'll, uh, she finishes her testing uh, later this month and um, she is, uh, all goes well. She will be starting the full-time basic academy at, in Pittsburgh in August of this year. The basic academy is 16 weeks, and then there's a couple weeks of post-basic training. So it just give you a sense of how long uh, the process takes. Uh, because she's already part-time certified, uh, we're able, we will be able to uh, hopefully start uh, front-loading some of her field training. But just because for any candidate, when they go to the police academy, they also still uh, will, will have several weeks of structured um, field training with a certified field training officer, and we've got a few in the department, just to make sure that from a, you know, from a legal process to uh, the Montpelier way, if you will, uh, that that any any new officer is instilled with all those those skills, so we know they're going to be effective um, once they are on their own. So it's a very lengthy process. This is the. Uh, there's been a change I didn't, I wasn't able to update on, on this slide. This is our structure for dispatching. And as you see on the end, dispatcher Danielle Frattini, she is the, the candidate that we've identified that will be uh, our next police officer. And we've already hired and are training uh, Miriam Larkin, who's not on, the, on, on here, as, and she is our, our newest uh, full-time dispatcher. In addition to these, to the structure here, we have seven full-time dispatchers one of whom is a dispatch supervisor, and that's Fred Cummings. We're also very fortunate that we have three um, part-time, as needed, dispatchers. Each one of those was a former full-time dispatcher with our department, so um, that really helps us out when you we know, cover time, vacation, or when we get down staff. And then parking division, we have one full-time CS uh, community service officer. That's what 
it'll be different when Tom McCarl talks about CSO from when I talk about CSO. <laughs> um, and then we have, and the other, and uh, Sheila works uh, half time, and and Charlie is a reti retired from the Department of Public Works as a as, as a supervisor, and he is um, he so he has very limited hours, but what he does is he is does a lot of the mechanical, the behind the scenes maintenance downstairs in the basement uh, of our of the, from the meters to helping uh, work the kiosk, and also does the collections. Um, so it's a very small but very. Uh, Little team. Uh, just, uh, real quick again, what does CSO stand for for you? Community Service Officer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and a lot of that because they are represent, they do represent the department on the street, uh, especially during high tourist times, but they can handle a variety of general questions. And also when we have big events, July 3rd, uh, Corporate Cup, where we also, they will assist at intersections and, and with traffic. They can't direct traffic in the same legal way that a police officer can, but we do, they, they definitely um, are part of our, our public safety team and, and uh, augment us uh, very nicely during those big events. This is just a snapshot of the <coughs> operations side of uh, and expenditures. What's not included here is the um, equipment side and also um, things like the, the, the station and the um, you know, the, the big picture uh, things. So most of this is in, is in salaries. And, and also, when you look at the communications budget, uh, what's not included there is, for example, some of the revenue offset between, like for, F, for this, for FY19, our primary uh, partner, which is still a contractual client relationship, is Capital West. And their, their portion for FY19 is about $340,000 that they pay um, to the city of Montpelier for dispatching services. And then there's uh, roughly to shy of another $10,000 from the Capitol Police. Those are the, that's the uh, department that actually um, is, works inside the State House. So in all total, we have about $350,000 in revenue for that year. And we'll talk a little bit more. I'm sure there's any questions about dispatching as, I'm sorry. Well, I just want to clarify that, you know, $300,000 or so is that, um, that reduces this line item yes. or that's on top of it? No, no, that reduces, reduces it. it. So our primary our primary function, it, it's uh, we have to be a, a jack of uh, all trades in some regard and, and a master as many as possible. Primary function is um, just general police and duties, that is be available for calls, we have patrol functions, uh, and it's, you know, and, and one of the one of the benefits of, to being in law enforcement is that you never know what you're going to do from day to day. And there's a diversity of, of needs, um, you know, for any community. And that's, so it really requires a, a work, a, a police department that is well trained and, and really engaged in the community. And that's something that we really pride ourselves on. To be effective what we, in, in our mission, we have, we rely heavily on partnerships and collaboration. In particular, we work very closely with the Vermont Drug Task Force. That is overseen by the Vermont State Police. Many of those cases, although uh, the larger ones, do end up being prosecuted by the United States Attorney's Office in Burlington. Uh, we also work uh, very, very closely with the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Uh, that's our primary, our most close relationship as far as all the federal agencies, but we're also well with FBI and DEA in particular, as well as the U.S. Attorney's Office. Project Safe Catch is something that started in Montpelier back in 2016, and it came out of a conversation uh, before the City Council in the fall of 2015. We just, what's, you know, where, where was Montpelier at with the opiate crisis? And this was a program that became basically a police assisted addiction recovery initiative. We, we looked, first of all, um, matter of fact, it was a clip that, that uh, Bill had sent me from, I think it was um, 60 Minutes or something, uh, about what Chief Leonard Campanella was doing in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And it was kind of, it was definitely groundbreaking at the time, where instead of just arresting and, and prosecuting addicts, uh, was really how to facilitate getting them to treatment. Um, and 
So from that, many, many communities, it's now fairly common, but merely many communities are looking at, hey, that makes a lot more sense. We were one of those communities. Uh, at the time, we were still less than 100 communities that were doing it across the country. We I worked closely with Deputy Chief Dave Grover up in Scarborough, Maine, uh, and their, their model was, uh, is what we try to replicate. The difference that we had on the ground here in Washington County with our hub and spoke was that we did not have a waiting list. Um, I didn't even know that until that council meeting in 2015. So working with Deborah Hopkins from Central Mont Substitute Services, she's like, hey, that's not the situation here. But yet we always saw in the media, uh, mostly originating out of Burlington, um, back when TJ Donovan was the state's attorney and, and uh, Eric Miller was the US attorney there, was we kept hearing about the six month wait list that uh, and that was, the, that, that, that was the challenge that Jinning County and the Burlington area in particular had. So when, we, when we, there were all these press conferences, we just, that was just being drummed into our heads. So when I also working with the undercover community, uh, law enforcement media, I said, what are the addicts saying? I mean, you know, what's, what's, you know, do you have the other opportunities where you're talking to these people? You know, why aren't they getting help or treatment? And a lot of it, a lot of it was, they were saying uh, that you know they don't they weren't even bought, you know, besides their own addiction and the way addiction works, but also they just didn't think there was really help readily available. So what so a Project Safe Catch, which is now countywide, every police agency has uh, signed on to this, is that we would help facilitate. If somebody initiates uh, at two o'clock in the morning, even I need help. They can come to the Montpelier Police Department. They can go to a, you know they can uh, fly down a trooper. They go to the Barry City Police Department and we will get them to where they're going to be supported. Now, at 2 o'clock in the morning, the hubs, you know, they're not going to have immediate treatment. So what we've done is we were able to leverage and partner with Washington County Mental Health and the Lighthouse. That's our public inebriate bed, which happens to be basically co-located with, with, uh, with uh, um, you know, the, the hub up in Berlin. And they've modified their mission so they could take somebody that's, um, you know, does not be opiate, but that was the focus. Um, they can be, you know, at least they're there with somebody else that can, you know, keep them supported until the hub, they're able to, to go in and, uh, and start, you know, it's not going to be full-blown residential treatment, but they can start that support and start that, that re hopefully, recovery. The other, uh, another important partner uh, with Body Safe Catch is the Emergency Department Central Vermont Medical Center. Um, in particular, uh, Mark Detman and Dr. Javad Mishkari. They've uh, worked very closely right from the beginning, um, so in case any patients need more critical care. Uh, also, um, as we, the other part of the opiate challenge is with the overprescription. And, you know, uh, Center One Medical Center was one of the uh, first emergency departments to restrict um, the amount of, of, of prescription narcotics that would be coming, you know, be uh, coming out of the emergency department for, for, for an issue. And also, what's, what's vital to any, any you know, um, strategy like this is we have to have the prevention and the edu educational side. So working closely with Ann Gilbert from the Central Vermont New Directions Coalition was also with us right from the start when we launched this. So we're pretty proud of the work. It's uh, the numbers have been unfortunately um, underwhelming, but the impact so far is has been substantial, and the impact I mean from a positive standpoint. We don't it, the, the I, without any I don't have the statistical. Uh, enough cases to show what the true impact was to Montpelier, but we did know that in 2017 we did not have any fatal overdoses in, that we know of in Montpelier. That includes, you know, when I say that, it's also the Montpelier Fire Department. Um, burglary was an unprecedented reduction of 50% burglary drop, and we had an overall crime decrease last year of, of thir roughly 13%. Um, and when I and one the only operational thing that we've done differently is Project City Catch. So anyway, it's just, um, and also symbolically, it's important to show law enforcement is absolutely committed to the health crisis that, that addiction is. And um, so anyway, so that's Project Safe Catch in a nutshell. Um, next, uh, I mentioned briefly in the walkthrough, uh, as a matter of fact, Councilor Bate asked me about the President's Task Force report on 21st century policing. Uh, this is, uh, it came out in 2015, and it was really when, right after Ferguson, um, was really, was obviously the flashpoint for where police community relations really started spiraling downward, 
And this task force report uh, highlights essentially six core pillars of, of policing. And, and from our perspective, those are timeless. Um, and those are, are essentially our guiding principles. And, they, and for the most part, even before this report came out, you know, you, 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 we were doing most of these things. The, and and uh, those, of those pillars, the last one, which is officer wellness, is something that we really took to heart more recently. And that includes, we have a police psychologist assigned to the police department. Um, that works with our with our dispatchers and our police officers. We have a dispatcher that's part of a peer support team, and we have a police officer part of a peer support team. And they're they're able to assist any other colleague in other agencies. Um, and that's all part of the EAP program called EAP First. So we're also um, definitely involved there. Physically, we uh, besides our training uh, for officer wellness, it also includes we carry a lock zone. Uh, every, and which is not which is primarily there in case we get exposed, but also we're there for the community on that and and other um, tactical casualty care type training that all of our officers receive, as well as um, appropriate uh, defensive ballistic protection and keeping our officers safe. And, and uh, so that's uh, that's really the big uh, focus. Whereas the other, the crime prevention, community policing, uh, public trust and accountability. Those are things that I think the Montpelier Police Department historically have always valued. Um, so, so that's why I say that the officer wellness piece is kind of the, the, the crystallized new, new um, part of, of how we deal with our department. Dispatching, Capital West uh, in Montpelier, we, we deal with uh, 18 communities that we provide fire EMS dispatching. Um, and it's really gone from a, a, a smaller contract to we're really building a partnership, and that includes uh, radio procedures, protocol, and and, and there's, there's, there'll be a lot to discuss uh, you know, later on. And, um, I don't, I'm not going to do a, a presentation regarding the CVPSA, that, but those are all things that we've been all working together. What are the, what's the right next step to take for a dispatcher? The parking, for those that don't know, we roughly have 100, uh, 425 parking meters scattered about this the city. Um, and uh, we also manage a variety of, of major events, including even, even today, um, you know, our department participated with the security and, and, and preparations of, of the, uh, the governor's bill signing. So performance measures, uh, how we're we doing. Uh, right now, we start off uh, a couple years ago on our strategic planning process and unfortunately I will tell you that it is absolutely stalled. Um, part of that is what is the right information, what are the right benchmarks to determine are we, you know, how is the community better uh, for what we get, what we are doing and how we are doing it. So so we're, um, so our feedback it comes from, uh, from a variety of sources but that's something that we have not lost sight of but it's, it's an area that we, we need to work um, certainly in Again, making sure that we're, we're not just putting in, it's, it's easy to say how many car stops we make, um, but again, what's the relationship to those car stops and traffic safety? Uh, so. Uh, can I ask you a question? Sure. What's RMS? Records Management System. Oh, Sorry. right, okay, yep. Thank you. Uh, that's, and we use what's called Valcor. There's two, program, there's two systems in the state. There's one is Spillman, the other is Valcor. And it's not, it can't do, um, it's, it's very limited. Uh, as far as it's not a computer dispatch system, and some of the report features, um, it's getting a little better. So I can run some basic statistical um, reports, but but from a true robust comp stat model, where where officers can have like kind of a real time uh, snapshot of where we need to focus our attention and what partners we need to bring to to uh, address a particular problem in a timely manner, it it, it doesn't. We're just not there. There's just more some some of the uh, just giving a, a sense of, of uh, how you know busy we are and we are struggling especially with the nature of protests uh, in the last really the last two couple of years uh, special events um, we just don't quite frankly we're really uh, beyond the limit of, of having enough uh, officers to do what we're doing but the, to meet the expectations of the community uh, and. And also we have to think about, back to officer wellness, we have to think about those, those police officers. Uh, the captain and I 
routinely come in on weekends um, to assist when there's protests, major events. The city does a lot of wonderful uh, events, uh, but again, in today's just, you know, just just the nature, uh, the threat nature, uh, the potential, uh, it's not what it was five five years ago, and even you know, <coughs> certainly you know, 20 years ago. So there's things that we're thinking about that kind of keep us up at night. Um, so the public, so everything feels the same, and, and how when you're, whether it's a farmers market. Uh, July 3rd, uh, Corporate Cup, you know, whatever the event may be, but a lot of these unplanned ones are really starting to burn, burn out folks because, um, you know, people, it's hard to plan on things when um, there's another event that's around the corner. Do you, uh, <coughs> do you have the ability to call on, like, uh, sheriff dep deputies to uh, assist with some of these big events? Yes. Um, that's come a long way, uh, but there's still certain things that are absolutely um, a pillar responsibility. Um, but a lot of the protests are really centered on state issues and not they're, have nothing to do, quite frankly, with the city, whether it's the pipeline protests um, or even today. I, I, was in a, I was in the command post uh, in the Unified Command with state police and, that all, and Capitol Police. So we're kind of all on it together, so that's come a long way. Uh, we have an MOU when there's a crisis um, that any of the departments in Washington County will support one another, includes the state police. Uh, but uh, one of the challenges that we have in the summertime is that this, the sheriff, uh, Sam Hill, is a little bit limited uh, as far as when he has resources available to us as well. So, um, and then, so, but it, it, so in, in short answer, yes, we do get help where we can, but it's not uh, the kind of situation that we can routinely depend on and also um, you know, we have to be careful of uh, you know we have a standard not the other departments don't have a certain the same standards but um, when, when mom, we don't use part-time police officers here in Montpelier mm -hmm. just because of you never know what, the, what they're going to be you know what's going to be they're going to have to deal with uh, whether it's a mental health call uh, right in the middle of, of, a, of a major event things like that so we're, we're very careful um, and how we do that, and uh, but there is a, a just a shortage in the, of statewide of, of law enforcement. Thanks. Can I ask um, these statistics? Are these annual in the past? Yeah, I'm sorry. These all these numbers here. This this represent 2017. Okay. Um, our social media, we use Facebook, um, and. Uh, <laughs> So take that for what it is, but it's right now it's the it's uh, it has been quite successful for us. Um, we've not started. Some departments will use uh, you know, Twitter feeds and um, for more timely uh, you know communication exchanges with the community. But again, when you do that and you create that expectation, it better be there all the time. And that is absolutely we just don't have the capacity um, capability to do that. Yes. This might be more of a question for Bill, but is that an area where we could potentially? Um does the police department have to be the ones actually doing the posting? Could no, the manager um, office we kind of take we some of that work? Uh, uh, especially um, when we've had situations at you know at, at the high school. Um, I don't just mean the, the this January, but other um, very such serious situations that we've had at you know in our schools. Um, as soon as I can, I'm communicating with Bill, and because I'm not in a position where we have a uh, fully established uh, incident command. Uh, where we would utilize, um, like, you know, like Sue has been our, uh, was our public information officer at a unified command, for example, um, at the March for Our Lives command post. But when things are really happening in the moment, I absolutely rely on on uh, the city manager's office to really get that word out for us. Yeah, to, just to expand on that, you know, the city has a Facebook page and the police do, and we always will repost theirs and usually likewise. But they post on their own it's usually very informative things like this is something it, it's usually not in a during a crisis it's like yeah. time to get your bikes inspected or did you know that your police are doing it? it's very informative and I think they actually like that part of it for emergency communications right there in the middle of doing what they're doing we take that right over okay. it's just an area I'm wondering about you know efficiencies and one person responsible right. for all the city's Facebook pages or something but if it's if it's working, then yeah. And for, and for emergent, you know, notifications, we use Vermont Alert 
and there's certainly preloaded templates, and, and that's something that, you know, an incident commander, uh, whether it's from the police, fire, uh, we can get those out um, um, pretty quickly, um, which can also be you know, geo fence. In other words, if it's something, even a, a situation that only involves the meadow area, you know, we can just highlight that area, and anybody, depending on what level somebody has signed up for, or we can do. It's kind of like the reverse 911 for for, for landlines too. Um, so if it's a, an emergency, we can do that type of notification, and that'll be the part of the Vermont alert system. Tony, can you break down 481 accidents? It seems like a lot. What does that, what does that make? Parking what makes lot up that number? Fender, bend, fender benders. Fender benders. Uh-huh. Is there a particular part of, of town or roadways that have these fender benders? Because it doesn't say auto accidents, so I wasn't sure if it yeah, was. Yeah, um, no, those are, uh, you know, oh, the serious accidents, I must say, are, uh, and I give a lot of credit to Better Road Engineering and the work of Public, uh, the work of public Works and AOT. Um, I don't know if you called long, long time ago, uh, the intersection of 2302 by, uh, mm -hmm. by Formula Ford um, used to be one of the a very dangerous intersections statewide. Um, and we've had horrendous, very bad, bad car accidents there. And, and now, um, knock on wood, our, our serious accidents, unless it's somebody that's um, you know, driving a, a, a you know, insane speed or drunk driving um, we have very few uh, serious accidents fortunately so but we still have to respond to those um, and essentially we're just facilitating exchange of information we're not investigating those but it certainly takes a big chunk of our day um, and it's usually on day shift so. is it I forgive me I don't actually know this is it um, Required that somebody call in that situation, and if not, should we do some better public information about if it's just a fender bender, just exchange your insurance information? Yeah, um, yeah, we we, we certainly have a, we've had a lot of internal conversations on uh, and, and other at state level even about how to best manage this because it, uh, you know slide offs, for example, for the state police, same same thing that they're frustrated with, um, you know, during a snowstorm, uh, you know, which ones do you go to, which ones not. A lot of time with fender benders too. Sometimes people, you know, get pretty hot headed. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I just once we get there, and, and if we're busy, you know, we'll prioritize calls. Still, if we can't get to it, we'll just have dispatch explain to them, just have them exchange information. So we do try to manage it there, but we, we also, um, yeah, again, we're not doing a, a, a full narrative or detailed investigation, and then the rest just becomes uh, goes into. A, our records management system, and then later the insurance company requested. So that's one of those public record requests, technically. Uh, we're just getting it to the uh, insurance companies when they request it. But I'm just wondering if we could we could reduce that cost by doing a little bit of, you know, reminding the public that they don't yeah, if the, they don't have yeah, to. Yeah, the duty you know to, to report the accident to uh, to DMV is is by statute. And that has to do any if there's any injury and you know we should definitely be called obviously when there's ever any injury potential injury and if um or if there's you know potential dui mm -hmm. uh, you know there's a lot of factors so that's 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 the other challenge that we may have i mean what do you do if somebody's intoxicated whether right. it's under drugs or alcohol you know we don't want to miss that either but but we're always looking at is um it's certainly a, a major um you know resource challenge for for law enforcement as a whole. Chief? Sure. What's, uh, what's overtime looking like these days, especially with, you know, all this on your plate and having the vacancy compared to previous years? Is um, a lot of mandatory overtime? Well, it's a lot of mandatory overtime, and actually we are still, uh, unbelievable. I'm surprised, but we are under budget at the moment. Um, not, you know, by... Uh, not much. <laughs> not much. <laughs> but, but you could say we're not over yes. budget. <laughs> right, right. Which is, uh, you know, um, and I don't have a great explanation for that. But uh, I think, you know, because usually, yes, when we're full strength, um, we can reduce that when we're, you know, uh, don't have our, our full, full, full contingent. But then we, then we certainly have to add to that. Um, but it, it, a lot of it is, um, you know, training. Can be part of part of our overtime, but also it's like public works too. What's what are the events? Um, you know, what's the weather? There's there's a variety of factors that can uh, 
to, to but, but yeah, but right now, this, right now, we're okay. When, and, and this is actually the, probably, I, I think since I've been chief, the first year that I can remember at this stage of the budget that the overtime has not been starting to look a little on the scary side. Thanks. Um, also, the other thing that suffered, but we try to, um, when we had 17 officers, uh, bike patrol is something that's, that's I think, uh, very near and dear to my heart and to the department. And um, it's just, a, I can't say enough about how valuable the tool is uh, of just bike patrol. I would like to do more of that, um, but it's hard to do that when you're, you know, you've got two, generally two patrol officers on the shift. Um, and, uh, but it's something that um, I'm hoping as we look at um, you know, at least getting back to where we used to be at 17 officers um, and uh, possibly even at least considering 18, um, but, but doing more of those of that particular. Now look at that as a program, it's a, just a good tool. So, um, you know, foot patrol is, is very important as well, uh, but as a former bike officer, um, I can tell you that the bike is just, uh, you know, you still have all that, you know, you're very approachable on the bicycle, you know, from, from adult to child, you know, a seven-year-old can say, hey, you're on a bicycle, I'm on a bicycle, we have something in common. Um, and also, the, the bike can get, we can get from point A to point B very quickly with stealth. Um, and, it's, and also, um, as we all know, living in Montpelier, we have two main streets, and sometimes it can be like driving in Midtown, you know, when those two streets are all jammed up in traffic, and the bike is just, can move very quickly safely through there. Um, so, and coffee with a cop is something that, that one of our, uh, Mike Philbrook had brought to our department a couple of years, several years ago now. And that's also been just um, a really great opportunity to have uh, a very low key, non-adversarial setting. Uh, and just talk to anybody about anything. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, many of these, Mike and other officers, they, they will bring our, our policy manual they will bring a copy of, of the task force report on 21st century policing. Um, and, and, you know, unless it's an active investigation uh, or something that's operationally sensitive, you know, any one of these officers um, can answer any question about how our department functions and where our priorities are. On that, um, do you have one coming up or is it a regular schedule? It's thing? not regularly scheduled. A lot has to do with uh, what Q wants to host us. Yeah. Um, so the most recent one, we were um, over at Down Home uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, we've done them at the uh, Senior Activity Center on Berry Street. Um, and the very first one that we kicked off um, uh, several years, many years ago now, was at uh, Birch Grove. Um, so we keep moving around. And uh, um, so it's a, but it's a really just a great opportunity to, to meet with the public where it's not a car stop. It's, it's, you know, we're not focused on something else, um, like during a parade or something, where we can just really have a conversation. And that is, that's really important, and that's one of the beauties to, to small town policing. Um, so we've had a lot of successes. I've touched upon many of these. Uh, the, our, what's gonna be really important when you think about the budget, and, and I will be, um, this, as we prepare, you know, for the 2020 budget, trying to um, hopefully the, there'll be an opportunity to get the department back to full, what I would consider full strength. Um, but what's always been really important, and the city's always been very supportive, is that we always maintained our training goals. Even when we we had reduced staff, going down to 16 officers many years ago, um, you know, city manager was made clear to me. Do not cut your training because when we're looking at what's left to cut, what's left to cut, and and that's something that um, is absolutely critical in, in today's policing environment because of the, the public expectations, the demands, the diversity of the job require us to have the best training that we can afford, um, and still, you know, without having everybody in school all the time. And for example, right now, uh, one of our officers is at Roger Williams uh, for two weeks. He's the last of our supervisors. He's a corporal to go through the command training. Um, earlier this earlier this winter, we were a very fortunate opportunity. Uh, Brandon, Chief Brandon Del Pozo was able to get Dr. Bryant Marks, um, who used to be part of um, the White House team under, under President Obama. 
who is a subject matter expert on implicit bias training, and uh, I, I was able to listen to his presentation uh, down in Washington uh, back in 2016. And he was able to come up here, and we were so fortunate to get every one of our sergeants, captain, and corporals to go through that training. Um, and that was, a, you know, it was like twenty thousand dollars to get them to come up to Vermont, and, uh, and every one of the officers uh, had the same re reaction that I did. I mean, th that he's he's just one of the best in the business, quite frankly. So that's the kind of training that whenever we see those opportunities, we always try to seek. So to make sure that our officers um, are on, on top of how we, you know, because sometimes we might say, hey, we're, we're doing it right, but you have to look at, you know, what is the data telling us? You know, we have to, you know. We need guidance on looking at ourselves in the mirror, um, and, and uh, especially it's a little easier for our department because it's because the, the the statistical the data is, is smaller. Um, as a matter of fact, the most recent um, uh, report that uh, Dr. Sanguino of UVM just just released, um, she really only had to focus on I think three departments just because of the, to get to have the relevance needed. And that was Vermont State Police, and now we're at Burlington PD, and I think uh, um, uh, South Burlington. I don't even think Rutland was on there. And our department was one that did participate with our data, um, but again, I did, there was nothing this, on this report because the last report was was heavily flawed from uh, um, uh, from various standpoints, and so she was she tried to correct the um, the process, and, um, and and also the Vermont Chiefs of Police uh, also helped support. Of some subject matter expertise to, to to get that. So those are the things that we always need to be doing: is looking at, you know, it's it's one thing do we do we think we're doing it right, but how do we know we're doing it right? Um, and that's always, um, you know, has to do with listening and then looking at what you know are for any patterns that uh, again that's what implicit bias is. It's, it's a bias that we we have but we don't really think about. Uh, explicit that's the easy one, um, but that's uh, so anyway. That's just an example of the kind of training. The diversity of training that we're always seeking in our department. Uh, Tony, is any of your training that you have appropriate to open beyond the police department? Uh, we've talked about things like Citizen Academy, um, but once again, I mean, we are so bare bones with our staffing. There's so many things that we would love to do um, for the community and, and for ourselves, too. Uh, it's a two way street that we just um, don't have the resources. We are just right now. We are barely keeping up, um, you know, with with the day to day challenges. Um, so, um, so I think, um, but I, and I think that's the the best venue to do that is to have like a citizen type academy where we can talk about these things uh, and bring in outside educators that that can help be there for both um, the community members and for the department. But, but generally, it's uh, it's law. You know, most are law enforcement specific. Mental health area response is uh, that's one other um, area that we are um, very proud of our reputation and, and our collaborative work with Washington County Mental Health in particular. Um, back in 2011, when Mary Moulton was interim commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. She had an idea to launch after you know, we lost, after Irene, when they had to revamp the whole mental health system. It really wasn't a system, even from my perspective, then, uh, is that how do we, how can we have better outcomes when there's a police involvement with somebody in a mental health crisis? And Team Two was born from that, from Mary's, Mary's idea. And I, the, our department, Vermont State Police, and other state, stakeholders, um, and I'm still on the steering committee for the Team 2 training model, but it's a joint response training between mental health and law enforcement working in a, um, it's an eight-hour program to, uh, and it's a, it's a scenario-based uh, training where you really understand who does what. In other words, once the safety issues and some legal issues are dealt with, the whole point of, of a, a response to somebody in crisis, whatever that crisis may be, is to get them to the appropriate level of care, which once the safety piece is done, it's not a law enforcement issue. And, and that's where, um, so Team 2 is based on the model of, the historic model of how Montpelier PD has always worked with Washington County Mental Health. And even as a, as a former negotiator for our department, um, I've had difficult scenarios, where, uh, scenes where I was negotiating, and even though it was a, because of uh, you know, weapons or a threat of weapons, 
it was always important to have, knowing that I had a mental health screener right there with me just in case. And sometimes if I wasn't getting through this to, uh, to somebody, I'd introduce you know, the screener because we worked so closely with them. That's, and so that's something that we're really um, proud of our, how, how that works. The so colonel, if I can, sorry to interrupt. Okay. Um, I just want to express that I'm feeling the tension between um, wanting you to be really thorough. Oh, okay, I'm and, sorry, yeah. And um, I know we've got a few more slides to go. So, okay. get, but I am really interested in the challenges. So, all right. I, I just wanted to make sure I said that out loud. Okay. Well, the challenge is the size of the, right now, we just need, I think, more police officers, and I want to maintain the, the, tr the, the, the training and what we've been doing. We've got good equipment. Um, can I ask a couple of questions about those challenges before you move on? Or are these, maybe those are the, like an expanded version of the challenges? Um, some, yeah. It's okay. Well, I just saw on there, there was a facilities need. Um, yes. I mean, I know we have a 0.25 facilities guy. Mm -hmm. uh, is that enough? Is that working out? How it's, it's, could it's, more? So far we're getting by. As a matter of fact, um, Steve Twombly today just, uh, is finishing up the RFPs for our, um, our to get rid of our chillers for our cooling system, which have been very problematic on the station, to the heat pumps. So uh, again, it's it's um, once we have identified those projects, yeah. you know, who's going to manage those projects? Okay. Uh, um, and then secondly, um, I saw also on there just an increased reliance on um, IT services. Mm -hmm. And again, like, is it enough? Or is, is we it could working? use a little. Uh, you know, I know uh, Seth, our, our, the city's IT person, spends quite a bit of time in our police yep. department. Yep. Um, and we're getting by. Okay. So it's working. It's, uh, okay. That's all I need to know. Thank and, you. And also, to uh, uh, you know, point out, um, we also have an officer that does a lot of in-house work on some cool. of our other systems, uh, whether it's the cruiser video, the station video, and audio, um, to even our ID card badges. Have you had any need that interfaced with the consultant IT? You know, we changed from no, two. No, that, that is, you know, Todd can talk more about that um, as far as, you know, we haven't, you know, I, I, I'm always having that, you know, keep my fingers crossed, especially when we look at, look at Atlanta and the denial of service uh, ransomware, um, you know, trying to make sure that we are not vulnerable. So I am uh, hoping that, and uh, again, I'm pretty old, so I, I think we put, we, there's too much reliance on, on, on computers in some regard, but I also know it's the only way we operate. But it's so far we've been. It's, it seems it seems to work well. But again, Todd, Todd can explain more if need be on that. As far as um, ransomware, we do have services in place to back up everything. It, I'm finding that a lot of these instances that we're hearing that are in the mainstream news, um, a failure to back up or to back up that is not offsite or not encrypted or protected in a manner that allows the community to restore. So. Um, our, while we could lose work or data, uh, potentially we're looking at probably a two hour window of recreation. So if we were at a 10, we could lose you know, between 8 and 10 a.m. worth of data. Uh, but as far as critical backup and infrastructure, radios, communications, those are all um, have secondary systems to fall over onto so that we wouldn't, have a, we wouldn't jeopardize emergency services. Thank you. The continuity of operation plan, which we have for, for the police department, uh, just in general too, all of our sites are, you know, our department has a generator, city hall has a generator, which also powers the fire department, and our radio, our radio <coughs> system, which is, includes national life, is a generated site. <coughs> and, our, and our secondary, we had to evacuate the police department, our secondary location um, is also one that's generated. Uh, is that, uh, as far as the challenges? I think yes, that's covered. great, thank okay. you. Uh, I'll need to look at the news. Uh, obviously, this, the, you know, the, the uh, um, you know, what's happening, um, dark web, big, big challenge. Uh, people are buying narcotics that way. To um, most recently, we also saw a back page, something that we've known about for quite some time, as far as um, you know, potential prostitution and other, was finally was shut down um, just the other day. The uh, mandatory domestic violence training for this year, all police officers are required to, to have, is based on the cyber crime scene in, in um, intimate relationship violence. And uh, so, so technology is something that we are doing the best we can to, uh, to stay on top of. Major problem, uh, I alluded to earlier, just recruiting retention quality officers. 
So we all, for the most part, we've had a very stable workforce. Um, and as a matter of fact, last year, uh, up until that officer left, we had we were at, uh, as far as we could tell, a historic high as far as stability went. Um, and uh, it takes a long time to train officers. We're coming up on um, both state police, having many, many people uh, retiring. Uh, our department, we anticipate uh, one retirement this year of a senior. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then um, the captain and myself are looking, you know, we're at that age too, where we're looking at two to two and a half years. So we're also trying to do the best we can with succession planning, making sure that the department is, is at hopefully its full strength. Um, so, so whoever succeeds me, whether it comes from outside um, or inside, you know, that we're, we're off on the right foot. Do we do anything with the um, with internships or a school resource officer getting kids interested in careers in policing? Or is there? <laughs> I don't know. It's, yeah, uh, we do. We have um, we have had interns from Norwich in the past, and then various projects with us. Um, the challenges that I talk about here, whether it's the Montpelier Police Department, uh, I've even had that, that. This conversation I've even had back when he was still director with Director Comey uh, a couple years ago. The FBI was facing the same challenges that we are, um, and especially with the, the, the a lot of people just do not want to go into um, public safety. For a variety of reasons. This is a national conversation. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. We I'm have just wondering. Wondering. ICMA conferences. It's one of the top yeah. topics. Is uh, there anything here we could be doing? Well, we look, yeah, we're doing, we, we've made a commitment. Uh, we're doing more at Norwich just uh, um, last week. Norwich every year does a CSI symposium. And we had uh, uh, an alum, another Norwich alum, Mike Philbrook, was there to um, do a mentoring piece. And we had one of our dispatchers uh, there as well. Um, to, uh, uh, so we're participating there. Um, we, you know, and, and uh, so we're, and I've reached out to all that, are, you know, to all of our, our, you know, our folks saying cause we have, you know, Champlain alum. Um, we have, we have a ca some Castleton, Norwich, to just use those opportunities wherever you can to <coughs> help plant seeds. Um, so, but it's a, it's a really, you know, it's a, it's just a difficult profession and. You know, even other city jobs that are available. Uh, you know, the pay is comparable, um, and for other departments, and it's not being a police officer. Um, so, with the with the uh, working, you know, the, the the hours that that these folks do. So, uh, so you know, um, I think everything else is pretty. You know, we're, we're aware. Any questions? Anything else? But. Um, some of the key, I have, I've already hit on the, some of the highlights here. Um, officer safety issues, fentanyl, uh, it's also something that's been on the news quite frequently. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that was one of the main reasons early on in 2015 that we started, um, we, we see training and started carrying naloxone. And it's just one more uh, layer of, of danger to things that their, their officers are faced with uh, routinely. and. And still one of the largest, uh, larger, you know, I don't know if it still is one of the largest, uh, of the largest, but fentanyl arrest in Vermont was here in Montpelier uh, a couple of years ago. Um, top of probably safe catch, just no, noteworthy events. Uh, the, the case of, um, of the killing of Marcus Austin, Javin Cavallero's case is still, uh, it's, it's still in process. And, um, We've done really well, uh, and we, we, every time we have, uh, even today, when we have these uh, protests, marches, major events, um, we bring in a lot of partners, uh, Intelligence Center, Homeland Security, uh, State, State Homeland Security. We do uh, debriefs and hot washes. What, what, what can we do better? Uh, for example, uh, the Women's March, which overwhelmed us completely. It wasn't a matter of needing more law enforcement resources. It was a matter of, you know, we didn't have any coordination uh, in a timely manner, because we did, weren't expecting it with the agency of transportation. Um, so since then, we've, we've uh, so from uh, March for Our Lives, we had AOT along with um, uh, pub our public works as well from the early phases of planning. So, um, but we, uh, we were doing pretty well there. And then, um, even though I had a very tragic outcome, the, re the response, um, as difficult as it was, for um, the bank robbery at the BSCCU this winter in January, 
um, you know, I want to highlight is that our school resource officer that happened at the high school there is also one of our negotiators. And, and so he was able to track the subject and then um, and coordinate the containment of him, get this, you know, the school was able to implement their safe, their, their procedures that we train on with all of our, all three schools and our safety planning. Um, so, and, uh, you know, but that's something that was obviously, um, and there'll be more, um, more coming, we're just waiting for the press conference um, with the Attorney General, um, as well as the State's Attorney, so we can then um, really, uh, people will see a lot of, you know, there's a major investigation involved, both for the robbery and then also obviously the officer involved shooting, which was the first one in the department's history. So. Uh, that, uh, sorry, I went a little on <laughs> okay. there, but uh, <laughs> any questions about anything? It's, Quick one, Chief. Um, it said uh, 425 parking spots were enforced in the city. Um, well, that meters anyway. Uh, yeah. Meters. Uh, still, uh, I heard there was an arrangement with the Capitol Plaza there in the back. Is uh, some, some, some of the private spots enforced as well in the city? Yeah, we have an arrangement with, uh, there's a lease that the city has uh, with Capitol Plaza. And we do provide enforcement um, for those spaces back there. We also have our we have our kiosk area, as well as working with Capitol Plaza. So in that particular case, the city leases part of those four public spaces where people can uh, purchase space. But as part of the lease, if, if uh, people are parked in their area without the hotel, of course, we can assist them. Depends on how. Big their events are. Well, sorry, I, I just want to thank the department for their work today. I, I was at the uh, bill signing, and mm -hmm. it was extremely adversarial. And the fact that there were no incidents and you know, nothing really bad happened. Hats off to yourselves and everybody else for your work today. Uh, thank you. Yep. There's a lot of moving pieces <laughs> behind the scenes. I've got one more. Yeah. Um, so in the past, we have kind of asked you to keep tabs on the costs of those um, protests or the street closures, um, especially um, street closures um, for, you know, various events. Um, and I would just like to keep, you know, tab on that. Um, so, you know, we don't need to talk about more tonight, but just know that, I don't know if others are interested, but I'm interested in kind of keeping track of how much are these things costing us just so that we can weigh, um, you know, in the future if we do need to charge fees and i know we've discussed whether or not that's practical that kind of thing but but so we're we know what the costs are right. um and also in our um conversations with the state about payment and load taxes um if it's you know their events are costing us a, a significant amount of money and we can show that i feel like that's gives us a little more leverage in those conversations just as a quick yeah we are tracking that um on, on the, the larger events uh working with uh, the corporate cup to something like that with, where it's a planned event that does make money, uh, that they can add enough to cover not only um, our overtime cost, but that's one that requires about 90% of the department to, to participate, but also the fire department, as well as public works uh, on that. So it's uh, so we're trying to work there. The only other, the other way to look at too, like for today, for example, um, we did have, we did not, Montpelier did not spend any overtime, but it, uh, and we participated in the planning, but I'm takes me out of out of my office to do Montpelier specific things. Um, so I will say that uh, we to the pilot conversation, what the state police has you know has, has brought in and, and the, how they stepped up their participation, uh, not only for the state level events but also for our own major events. Um, you know I got to say it's a it's a it's a true um, relationship that is balanced in that regard. Um, and and I, I don't feel like that Montpelier is now owning too much of a state problem. The protests are frustrating. We're never going to be able to bill for a protest, and we'd rather have one of the reasons also for the permit process. Um, at least we know it gives us a heads up, um, and, to, to, and at least to a certain extent, who's responsible for what. But on the protests, um, you know, some of them in the past, it's, you know, we might get a, uh, we have a good working relationship with some of, some of the groups. Um, environmental side um, but it's 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 always uh, kind of moving around it's things like the farmers market uh, if it requires uh, another event that require additional resources that we can have the, the conversation um, so I have a, a couple of questions um, one of the parts 
Well, first of all, thank you for all that data. That was great. Um, one of the things that I am going to, I anticipate we're going to continue to do as a uh, council is think about the data that we want to see over time. And so I'm just anticipating, um, you know, which are the pieces that we pull out uh, from the, you know, the RMS that you all have. It, um, and I, I appreciated that you separated out um, that there are that there's data about the city in terms of like the number of crimes, the number of burglaries, or uh, what have you. Some of some of that is or the number of car accidents, right? Like we we can't necessarily directly affect the number of car accidents that happen if we have safe laws or you know um, driving uh, rules. If there's a problem place or whatever, but. Um, that is that feels more indirect than you know ways that we're evaluating. You know, I guess we're not really evaluating the department, but like you know, and just in thinking about like how are we doing um, mm -hmm. as a as a city, um, and so you know one of the things just in terms of um, uh, data that we might want to be front facing um, for pu the public. Um, I mean, we as a group, I, I guess I would encourage us to think about like what are the the key indicators that tell us whether or not we are a safe community, um, and that tell us that our police department is doing well, and um, you know, the, the things that come to mind are obviously like you know how uh, how we're turning out in like the racial profiling um, evaluations, and uh, you know, our, our like I I love that in your presentation you had um, that the things that that. Uh, it was under performance measures, so I assume those are sort of performance measures that you're inviting, but part of that was feedback from prosecutors or feedback from outside agencies, like that, that stuff's harder to quantify, but that can be the most meaningful. Um, we have it in on the council on there with the prosecutors. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, um, in any case, uh, you know, that those are the, um, I guess you know, thinking about how we are evaluating ourselves um, is something I'm very interested in, and um, and it doesn't it doesn't all necessarily need to be hard data, and um, but I, I assume that we will we will want some hard data to, to show the public as to yeah the hard data is the easy one it's yeah. it's the you know that's why I kind of threw in there um, from again feedback from the prosecutor's office yeah. uh, also uh, circle which is our partner with domestic violence mm -hmm. uh, and. There's this reason why our department keeps getting asked, hey, can you serve on this? Can you do that? It's because of relationships and, you know, the efficacy of our, our and value of our work that we mm -hmm. do collaboratively. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, but what are, you know, but I need to know, too, uh, besides the day-to-day -day things, how, where do I focus our department and our resources in the most effective yeah. way I can? Right. Okay. So. Well, great. Part of an ongoing conversation. It will always be ongoing. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, any further questions? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. Okay. So we've done sure the break, licenses yeah. and ordinances. Um, so uh, I know Ashley is not here to necessarily talk about the Social Economic Equality um, Committee, but. Um, I mean, my, my understanding of this is that, well, I mean, it's even here in the, um, you know, in the information page for this item. Um, actually, do, or unless, Bill, you want to introduce it. I mean, I, mean I, I just talked with her and tried, ran this by her. I drafted it for her, and she said this is what she wanted to say. So I don't have, you know, I think she's interested in looking at these issues, and I think, um, I think she, she kind of sees a combined effort. There's and you know, my concern, but also the excitement about this. So what are the things that are within the city's, you know, there's certain things that the city government isn't, you know, we're not gonna cure root causes of poverty, we're not gonna cure the addiction, those guys. So what can we do within the resources we have that we can make differences in how we reach out to populations? So I think part of part of this community's role might be maybe as we think about ordinances or policies to help them look at those and say, what are we missing? Those kinds of things, and also our own, you know, maybe meet with each department and figure out what is you know, happening. Um, but then she was also interested in then engaging the broader community on some conversations that are beyond city government, being the catalyst for what can we at large do to be more, you know, 
Those were a twin goal. We talked it over, actually. Also last Wednesday night, before, before the tour. <laughs> so, uh, and then I quickly wrote this up and sent it to her. She said, yes, this is exactly what we talked about. So. Yes, Donna. Uh, when Ashley and I talked, we thought, I thought this was a real good follow-up from our resolution that we wanted, when we wanted to support and acknowledge the high school for Black Lives Matter, and by the same time knowing that we needed to engage the public with a better opportunities for all of us to grow and become more aware. So I saw this committee as being both systemic, dealing with the institution, but also bringing the community together for really community sensitivity, awareness on all sorts of inequality issues, whether it's race or uh, economics, but mm -hmm. I would hope that would also come out of this committee. And this read this way, I, I appreciate what you wrote here. It seems to nail it down. So, I don't but, thoughts. But the only yeah, other sorry. thing was I'd really like to see some clear stakeholders or whether we name a variety of people like high school students or people from organizations uh, within town, but that we actually think about the stakeholders and not just open it to 12 members. Something. Thoughts? Yeah, Rosie. So not responding to that, but separately or in addition to this, um, I had a conversation with Bill about um, whether this is part of the work that the committee does or just alongside um, that we would ask um, city staff to think, and this is you know work for us as well, but to think about um, the ways in which their different departments um, interact and if there are areas for potential inequity um, in you know our application process for something, or um, the hours that we have a service open, or how we advertise that there's financial aid for something, um, you know, I I can't name all the ways because I don't know. But the city staff are more familiar with their programs, and if we just make some time to to, to mental space to think about those uh, <laughs> issues, um, I would encourage Bill to to make that. Um, a priority for staff, um, but I wanted to kind of open that up and make sure that everyone else felt that way as well, and then um, maybe with that direction that kind of empowers that conversation a little more. That makes sense to me. Um, I, I think uh, from my thinking, a good analogy for what this is uh, trying to do is sort of similar to the Energy Committee in that uh, they have, you know, they see their mission as advising uh, this council, but then they also become, you know, a catalyst for public conversation and outreach and um, and other efforts besides things that are specific to the city. Um, but I, but I love this idea too of like if there's city staff that know, like this is potentially a problem. Like, of course that would be a great place to have that discussion and then bring it to council for an action if something needs to change or whatnot. And recognizing that people probably don't know right now that there's a problem because if there was I'm sure they would have identified it right. but to, to set aside some time to say okay we're gonna think through are there things and you know actually do that work yeah yeah I think that's where you know I think we we in terms of our own departments we, we have what we call leadership team meetings and we devote them to a specific topic about which should this be a topic how can our departments reach out to the population that maybe we're missing in the those kinds of things. And I think as far as the public piece, and again, the city engaging a community conversation, I think we need to be careful about being, you know, the morality priest too, telling everyone how they should see and feel, but, but creating um, forum for people to have those interactions themselves, and I think mm -hmm. the city can really be effective, and then also check our own activities and so one possibility is that um, it feels like there, there needs to be a little more definition uh, as to, you know, are we looking for 12 members? And if we were looking for 12 members, are we saving seats for any particular organizations? Um, I, part of me feels like we're not quite ready to put this out to the public yet. Um, I guess maybe we can throw it back to Ashley to say, come come with a specific proposal about, or unless unless people here want to make that proposal. <laughs> I feel like it needs a little more time. Yeah, and people have suggestions for, or, you know, and if you don't have any girls, you can come in, but um, for those particular groups that want to be at least in the room. 
thousand times. Yeah. Well, I guess at the high school, the Justice Alliance came to mind, and I can't remember the name that Kathy Johnson. CQ Strategies. Yep. Yeah. But Kathy is a yeah. Right. I mean, she belongs to a group, but likewise, talking to those groups and who do they interface with, it's like expanding that thought process. And, and maybe you have basically an information meeting to sort of sort out what this looks like and who should be members mm -hmm. before we try to make a decision in such a shallow knowledge base. Um, yeah, Justice for All comes to mind as well. Um, right. But then, you know, I'm also thinking about. Um, if there's somebody from the Bethany uh, Church with the homeless shelter there, that might be good. I mean, just brainstorming. Um, okay, so maybe we can ask Ashley or to work with city staff to come up with a solid, like more concrete proposal. That something that we could put out to the public to say, you know, we're looking for people to join this. Um, okay. Can I, um, so that that work that I was suggesting oh, can yes. happen simultaneously, um, I guess I might make a motion that we direct the um, city manager to um, make uh, inequity or, or, you know, looking for, for unintended areas of inequity um, within uh, city business uh, a topic of conversation. I don't want to be too specific here because <laughs> does that seem reasonable? Yep. Okay. I'll second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Uh, okay, so um, thank you. Um, and uh, okay, and I guess we'll look for this on an another upcoming agenda. All right, moving on to council appointments. Committee appointments. So some of these, if I am not mistaken, um, I like the first one. It's yellow. <laughs> there's, I assume we should just go straight through this, right? Um, there's no council rep on the uh, Americans with Disabilities organization, but that's okay, <laughs> unless somebody wants to. Correct. We have we have had council reps, and we have not had council reps. Does anybody want? To? And what do they do? Does, does it, yeah, I, I can imagine that some of these committees are committees that have a name but don't necessarily meet all that often. Some of them might be particularly active. So this group's pretty active. They try to meet monthly, I think, and they're working specific. So their main function right now is we, we're required to create this transition plan for how we're fully compliant heavily in the work side of getting a consultant to do that. Um, and then they will also discuss initiatives, like if you know, rec department comes in and you know wants to talk about a program, they'll give some advice to, to how that could work, and they'll sort of vet it out. And they have, on occasion, very rarely, uh, there's been a community problem. Somebody's raised a you know, non-city that there was a building in the community that they felt sort that out. That happens a lot less frequently. But they, they meet about, I think Sue's there, so I'm looking at her and nod, but I think you said monthly, right? It's monthly. And they do things, for example, the Mountaineers appeared before them to talk about some changes they want to make to the stadium to make it more ADA compliant. And the committee looks for ways to pay for that and ways to help them achieve what their goals. So, um, I, th I think maybe doing doing a little bit of intro for each of these groups might be yeah. might be useful. Um, so, is anybody interested in, uh, or shall we or shall we leave it as no council? Okay, moving okay. okay. on. Uh, the building code of appeals that uh, we do have Glenn actually pointed to that. That is um, a group that hears our building code does have an appeal process, and if someone wishes to seek some sort of variance or appeal of a ruling made by the building inspector, they can go to this board. Uh, they used to meet fairly regular basis. I think with the change in sprinkler regulations, that work was going to drop drastically because almost all of their appeals were sprinkler appeals. So at this point, it's Rosie and Glenn. Great. 
Capital Complex Committee, the city is entitled to one rep, uh, appointed rep, and Paul has been our rep for some time, and it's, uh, I think he's done a solid job representing us and Very fighting grateful. what is sometimes an uphill <laughs> battle. Um, but, uh, but it does, there's no requirement. For a long time, it used to be a member of the Planning Commission, but that changed, and now it's just a community person. And I personally see no reason to change. Capital Projects Committee, um, that is a committee that meets two or three times intently around budget time when we are putting together our capital plan, sometimes meets occasionally outside of budget season to go over status of projects and those kind of things, look at policies related. Uh, we've traditionally had three council representatives. Uh, the last two were John Holler and Justin Turcott, uh, and I think Gene had been on before that, so they are all they're not here, so we have two vacancies, and Donna has served recently. Don't we give this a different name? We call it the CIP, Capital, Capital Investment. Improvement Plan. Yeah. Okay. So okay. We, we, we I want to stay on we it. Use that, we Please. use that interchangeably. So okay. You're right. Okay. Oh. I just wanted to make sure that's the one I thought it was. Same one, yes. That's all right. Um, just to, I want to flag that, you know, so Bill and I have had some conversation about this group. I mean, this is the, this is where decisions are made um, about like, which roads get paved um, over the course of a summer, and uh, you know what stormwater projects are we going to tackle, and uh, you know any uh, uh, recreation path uh, improvements or, or whatnot. All those decisions get made there. Uh, so I mean that's it. Seems like there's a lot of uh, a lot of folks who would be interested in that, like those those decisions. So I'm interested in seeing what that process is like, and if we need to. Um, I know they, they haven't, um, or they, they don't necessarily meet that many times, but you know it might be um, something that we reevaluate what that process is like. And I think we will talk about this depending on time um, when public works yeah. comes in. That, that, you know, there's a lot of public works, so it'll probably be even longer than the police, but. Uh, you know, typically the, the process in the past, we, the council had, has established a funding policy for um, four capital projects, and we've been following that, and the budget has been budgeted accordingly, and so then it's fitting the projects into the, the funding. And typically DPW and staff puts together a rough draft. This committee reviews that and goes back and forth, helps prioritize and, and put those things in. Hate to correct the mayor, but the actual oh, approval is made by the city council. <laughs> that's no, that's the, fair. The, <laughs> the, um, the, the committee makes the recommendation. It's right. usually listed in the budget document. This year, um, there really was zero discussion about that. The council doing budget was just adopted as part of the budget. In other years, it has been lengthy conversation here. So, um, I think. I'm sure that will not be the last time you correct me. <laughs> <laughs> clarify. Let me yeah, clarify. that's fine. That's fine. Um, so, other people who might be interested in that? It's a great committee, folks. <laughs> really. Where is. the money is. <laughs> I, I think I could potentially be interested. I'm also curious, since there are three spaces, uh, whether it might make sense, and since it's such a wide ranging thing, whether it might make sense to have one uh, from each district. Uh, does that make sense as a pattern? So back when that is what we did, and intentionally. Yeah. And then over time, council got away from that, so we're we're back to the future. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the mayor was on for a while. So. And the mayor wanted, yeah, so that festival up too. But also just sometimes it was more. But anybody can come. It, it is open, but that is true. In some years, we have had more than the three on the committee attend meetings. Now we have to be careful about how the participation goes. You are allowed to attend a public meeting. You just careful about. So if the committee is discussing and you're the fourth or fifth council member, you can't really weigh in with your opinion. You can listen to the conversation and become informed, but you can't necessarily say, well, I'd be in favor of that. Now we know we have four votes. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to be careful of that. But you, people can attend. It's a public meeting. It's a public meeting. It is. I know. Meeting. It's just you have to be careful. Yeah. And it's posted. It's <laughs> very clear that, that in the, I checked that actually, you can attend public meetings. Yeah, yes. no, I'm not disputing that. I'm saying I think you might be able to say your opinion. Well, maybe you can. We've tried to be public. careful. Yeah. That's there you go. Um, 
I mean, if nobody else wants it, I mean, I'm, it, it is something that I'm very interested in, um, unless, you know, other people want it. Take it while you can and make it change tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, I'm going to volunteer myself for, because I can't get enough committees in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I will say um, for Glenn is that it is really good for a new person um, to be on because you really do learn a lot about all the projects going on and things that are happening. It's a, it's a good way to get acquainted with what's happening. But we also try to s do squeeze a fair amount of meetings in at a short period. You know, they're usually almost like weekly for three or four weeks and then that's it. And for, you know, maybe one other one the rest of the year or something. It's short, heavy lifting, and then uh, Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. Uh, we have a, a planning commissioner, Kirby, and Mike is our alternate, and that's all set. The Regional Planning Commission TAC, which is Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, Councilmember Bate has been our rep, and Tom has been our alternate. Okay, so these are two different things. Yes. 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 There's the actual commission, which we are entitled to having a commissioner on and an alternate, and then there's this, and again, the TAC, they really, they're the ones that deal with funding, transportation funding for the region and make recommendations. We negotiate which road gets done with the little bit of pennies we have <laughs> regionally. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a really a good group. They do think regionally about the volume of roads and, and how much use and pivotal. It's, it's been a very good group to be associated with. Um, Central Vermont Solid Waste Management, we are um, also a member, a voting member of the district. Ellen Cheney has been our rep and Donna has been our alternate. And I don't want to keep the alternate. Okay. Somebody else can come. Doesn't have to be a council rep, um, although it had been. In fact, for years we had a council member, Ian Huber was our rep for a while, and he couldn't keep it up, so he dropped our alternate and became a citizen. And then council alternate but it, there is no require that either be I mean, it's an interesting group you do learn a lot but if nobody's interested we could also put it out yep before we could appoint Ashley <laughs> <laughs> oh. she did say right whatever <laughs> should we put it out and then if that fails appointing <laughs> <laughs> no. Interested in this area, and we've we've had some really good citizen reps. So the Ellen's been really good, and um, Mia Moore before her mm -hmm. a long time. So Ellen seems to really like doing it too. So advertise. Sure. Uh, the Community Services Steering Committee, I'm not sure we need to continue that anymore. This was a committee that was created, oh, I just skipped the Citizen Advisory Board for the Community Justice Center. Um, so we are a community justice, there's a CAP uh, advisory board that they rely on heavily. Ashley has been very involved. I would suspect she wants to stay on. She's been a pretty key member on that. So. Community services, when we were looking at combining or merging some functions of departments with the community services group, we had a big steering committee with a facilitator and we had a council rep, Justin Turba, who was the rep. I don't know that it's active anymore. I don't think so. I think that's one we can probably scrap for now. Yes, Don. Do you think you'll recreate it when you, if the, if the feasibility study happens? Well, the, oh, the feasibility study for a facility? Yeah. And well, services. I, mean, I think that's different. This was about the actual services I know. themselves. Yeah. I think I think it would be a different group. Okay. I think we would consider okay. doing that if a facility study group that would be different than this. I think, okay. you know, we got this study, we have the plan and we're trying to follow it to slowly implement the plan. And I think we've been having some conversations coming up in the next couple of weeks about that, but I don't know that this group needs to remain in that across the map. Energy Advisory Committee, no need for that. We can <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, to be fair, uh, I don't need to be that person if anybody else would like to be that liaison. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
it's, it's, it's true that I don't really spend enough time with Kate, so that would be a way to. Uh, so you could that. be on the meeting. Yeah, there you right. go. But no, I think uh, I would be very happy for Anne to continue. Okay, that's fair. Well, I'm happy to do it. So. All right, uh, Green Mountain Transit Authority advisory again. This is um, we have a place on a board designated seat on the board. Uh, Harold Garabedian has been the city's rep uh, for a long time, has, I think, had active interest. We could check with him to see if he wants to continue, but last I knew he was pretty engaged in that group. Okay. But That's something that I'm semi-interested in, should it ever become vacant in the future, but um, I'm happy to have him continue doing the work if he's... Or you and Harold could share it, you know. We could home. talk to Harold. And you told me that the meetings were at 7 a.m., so uh, I'm not sure. In rolling <laughs> things. Yeah. What? I'm not that interested, but oh, I... Gosh. <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't, maybe they're at 8 and you have to leave. It's, I don't know. It's, 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 yeah, it's not super... I mean, I think for the Chittenden County people, it's not so bad. They have breakfast and they're ready to go on the way. So there's the further ones. There is that. But if you're interested, I'm sure you'd be happy to... Formerly interested. <laughs> um, Harry Sheridan Scholarship. Uh, I know more about that. I enjoy being that and I would person. Be the most yeah, being connected person. to the school. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to stay there if I can. Housing Task Force. We have a vacancy in the Housing Task Force. We do have a council rep who has at times chaired the Housing Task Force. <laughs> Go for it. Now, I am happy to keep doing this, but I heard, Rosie, that you were also interested in it. I'm interested. I don't need to be on it. I'm happy to just go occasionally and talk with the housing task force. Um, but if nobody else wants to be on it, I can also be the, the appointee. Well, I'm, I'm happy to be it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think people, I understand that there are people on the, on the housing task force who would be very happy if it continues to be me, if I'm <laughs> <Yeah. done> it. <laughs> well, and I, I do hope, Rosie, you, you know, you get to go as you Sounds need. Sounds good. Lots yeah. <laughs> and then the Housing Trust Fund, which is slightly different than the task force, which deals with the, the funding that we actually put in the budget each year. And you've been our, uh, well, we haven't gotten to meet yet, so I would like to stay on there so that I can <laughs> be part of at least one meeting. <laughs> as I understand, it's usually only one or two per year. Wants to figure out how they want to, you know, what they want to send out for RPs, and then meet to figure out where the money goes. And and I'm also on that board now. I've been to like, like you, one or two meetings or something. I haven't been to any oh, since okay. I was appointed, so I don't know if I missed one or. No, I don't. I don't you didn't. You were appointed. March of, well, it may have been May or June by the time I was appointed. Okay. I don't think they did anything last year. It had been allocated across, yeah, allocated so across the city, I think, yeah. To, to the so we'll really have two reps there, inadvertently, I suppose. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that's okay. Okay, great. It's not burdensome. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> great. It's, well, it's probably good, actually. Um, investment committee? Um, again, it doesn't have to be me. I've been uh, involved with uh, conversations around um, environmental, social, and governance related uh, investing. Um, but uh, if anybody else is interested, it does not need to be me. Okay. I'm happy to keep it. Give them away. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, the Montpelier Alive Board. Montpelier Alive has a board of directors. A few years ago, they opened up a seat for council rep, and then at some point, it became a non voting seat. I'm not yep. exactly sure how that all happened. I think I know, but I'm not really concerned. <laughs> um, but Jean Olson had been our liaison and attended the meetings, and obviously she's no longer in the council. Um, so it is a good group for us to have a contact with. Uh, that's a one. Is the mayor on by default? Is that I, why I'm I don't there? know. Is it maybe? I don't know why. I was actually going to ask you that. I, um, I was a little surprised to see my name there, which know. is fine. I mean, I'm. <laughs> no longer on. Okay. <laughs> So it is a group we give money to. It is a group that we depend on a lot with partnership. Now, obviously, we have a good relationship with them. Their office is right here in City Hall, and I think we have a cause for them. I'd be interested in that one. I'm going to fight for a vote. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Montpelier Foundation um, is a group that uh, takes donated money, basically, and, and has a charge to um, help take applications. It's specifically supposed to be for public infrastructure or things like that. Jean Olson was our rep and has asked if she could continue. She's interested in continuing. She's pretty engaged in the process. Even I said, he actually emailed her yesterday with her following up on something like that. So uh, obviously, we're not required to do that. But she is the seat allowed to go to a non council person? I think it's two city appointees. Oh, great. After the council, Tom, same thing, was appointed. Uh, what happened very briefly is that the kind of the whole thing went dormant for a while. And so we group tried to re engage to get it going. And they've been successful. So Tom and Jean, as council members, said we'll participate to try to keep the council presence to keep it going. But I don't know. I, I, we could check with Tom. I don't know if he's still interested. I might nominate Ashley. Okay. <laughs> well, or we can come back. I'm happy to have Jean continue on. I don't oh, know how sure. others feel. Yeah, oh, that's fine. Yeah, Jean is very clear that she wants to. Tom is the one I'm not 100% certain. Sure. That sounds, that sounds good. Transportation Infrastructure Committee, that's the city's version of that. You just appointed someone to that tonight. <laughs> Not as been the council rep. That is a designated council rep seat. And our revenue since it started. Yeah, I'd like to stay and invite anyone to come to any of our meetings. But One Taylor Street Design Committee, um, so Donna had been on that as well, along with Jessica and John. It's so how long it's been since they met. Um, it's a long time. So I'm interested in that one. If okay, we are. If it, it may never meet again. If it ever meets again, I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> I am getting some uh, connection, uh, some push from former members who would like to get together at least once. To sort of see where things are. I think the, the, the tension is that you know they had a lot role of role at the beginning of laying the thing out. The tension is you know we're about to go up to bid on this and build this and suddenly having it redesigned by committee. So I, you know we've been looking for what are some small decisions and I don't mean to make it meaningless, but what are things that they there's still room for input on and what we've done. I don't want to call I'd like to call a meeting that was meaningless, but I also don't want any more folks that are interested, so uh, maybe it's just a project. So, uh, but what I gather is it would be Ian, Donna, and Rosie. And, and, the, and you might just want to call it at some point when the project is like a ribbon cutting kind oh, of, definitely. or whatever, uh, or maybe some information before that stage, just so people feel included. You can uh, put it out as a party. <laughs> That's what that means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure that particular group is going to want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Engineer, yeah. Dan Peterson, I'll, I'll Don Marsh, <laughs> John <laughs> Snell, I don't know. <laughs> one or two, one of the citizen reps has already moved out of town. Yep, yep, she's a yep, woman. Yep. Okay, Central Vermont Public Safety Authority, we do have two reps to that. Um, council Member Bate, former Council Member Gamaka are the city's reps. Uh, yeah. I'm sure uh, the exact term, John, well, we talking about? Well, I sent you an email. Yeah. Actually, the, the Public Safety Authority terms are two years. So Tom's would have been 217 when he was reappointed to 219. So I'm the one that expires. It expires the same way as your seat does, is how it's lined up. So mine expired this year. And I'd like to continue, but if there's somebody else, I mentioned that to Ashley, although she didn't think she was still interested at this point, but, you know, express your desires. Can you say a little more about it? The Public Safety Authority, it's about the regionalization of all, ultimately, police, fire, ambulance, and dispatch. And we had originally, we had started out with a one center facility, and then an employee input, decided to have two 
facilities that could talk together, so we, redundancy in Barrie and Montpelier. And then we got really far with that last December and heard again from employees that they really feel like it needed one. So we backed off and now what we're looking at is getting a third party. Both Montpelier and Barry would like to have a third party participating. And we have a memorandum of understanding out with the Capital West that Tony talked about, the chief talked about. Capital West is the part that's just the dispatching, but Capital West is part of a bigger FAR mutual aid organization. So we're looking at the Public Safety Authority is, ha is having a, a vote on the 16th with this mutual aid society to join the Public Safety Authority. And that would give us our third municipal group, hopefully to move forward to perhaps bond for improved communications. We need a major tower. And I, I would have to have my paper in front of me. Tony could probably give you all the terms. But the fact that right now our towers, our radios are so impacted by not having the correct infrastructure that we have talk over one another, we even get Canadian chatter, and so we really need to clean that up, but it's a major couple million dollars, right? 1.3. 1 1.3, okay, I overjudged it, but it's a big project. And the idea is by getting the mutual, farm mutual aid involved, then everybody who has a contract with Montpelier now for dispatching would also have a commitment to help pay back that bonding. Versus right now, all the towns who have contracts can leave anytime <laughs> they want. So it leaves you pretty vulnerable. So the Public Safety Authority felt this was a very firm way to bring in 18-some communities to join us in a regional sense for dispatching. And then from there, hopefully, it'll grow. In a shorter version of that, it, or a, an additional version, <laughs> I think Donna explained. So Donna explained what... Well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> she explained what they're working on. I was just trying to explain the authority itself. It's a quasi-municipal authority. Yeah. Um, charter has been adopted by both Barry and Montpelier, approved by the legislature. Barry and Montpelier are the only two members. So each community has two appointed reps, and then there are three representatives elected from amongst the two communities to serve. So it's, a, it's an official board. So it's just a class of a committee, but it's a board. Yeah, but I wanted to get them enthusiastic about it. And, and we actually had uh, our recount, or uh, yes, challenge to the election yes. result last year. That's right, Sam. Yeah. Right in. Yep. Sam and Jim. Yep. yep. Both, we both ran as write-ins, I think. And yes. <laughs> yes, we were part of that recount. Yes. Yeah. Right, right back there. <laughs> yeah, for hours and hours. So that's what that committee is. So the question is, do we reappoint? Council member B for two-year I'll think about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Donna, you're willing to stay on? The right. We actually meet, uh, that group meets twice a month, first and third Thursdays, 6.30, Central Vermont Chamber mostly, but we do move around, Barry to Montpelier. You said you were meeting on the 16th. Is that April 16th or May 16th? The mutual foreign aid vote on the 16th, and hence we, I think we have, a, trying to get a committee with the, a meeting with the two mayors and the two city managers with the Regional Public Safety Authority mm -hmm. um, on the 17th, the day after the vote happens. Tuesdays. I have the dates, but I don't have the day of the week, sorry. Well, you just said they meet Thursday. Well, we, our regular meeting is Thursday. But this was a special. They're voting on the 16th. On oh. the 16th of April? Of, no. of May. Of May. May. They're, they are distributing the memo of understanding. All of their 18 member towns have to vote on it. And then we were trying to set up a meeting on our regular th third Thursday with a meeting with Barry and Montpelier's new mayors and city managers. But I thought the 17th was already reached out to you too, so I may have misspoke. 17th, so you're talking we do this? I just was trying to get a sense of which month actually, because it was 16th May. Was next week. May. 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 Right. So, um, but we can figure it out. Yeah. The housing task force all already meets on Thursday, so mm -hmm. I'm not going to put that. But I am curious uh, what the two towns in the county are that I'm part of. 
So Berlin and Barry Town were originally scheduled to be, when this was first con considered, was proposed to be the four communities, the true regional hub. And um, in the process of developing that and discussions, Barry Town and Berlin dropped out of the process and went ahead with just the two cities. Um, I think in most people's opinions that was to the detriment project. It doesn't mean something can't happen, but it certainly isn't what we hoped as far as a true regional system, and I think we'd all love to get them back in somehow if we could. Water Rate Study Committee. Um, are we doing anything with that? <laughs> <laughs> At this time, I don't expect a lot of lifting. However, depending on what happens with our wastewater treatment plant and those types of bigger um, issues, it may be appropriate to convene a committee to discuss rate structures to address that. Otherwise, I don't, you know, so it's really kind of, we should have someone on hand, but I don't expect much heavy lifting out of the, a meeting or two to address rates sometime around first of the fiscal year. So Usually that's what July. this role does, is screens the rates and makes recommendation to the council for water and sewer rates. I would be interested. Not on these four committees. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even sure what the study committee is. I, know, I was just looking at that. It should just be the, the T.W. Wood board. Right. Yes, I think it, it's got a rate study attached to it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, the printed one does just says board, but the one on the agenda has. Um, and I think the mayor is sort of by by default a, a member. Um, so I, I was the mayor's rep when I was a council member and um, I mean it's a great group. I enjoy being a part of it. Um, I, the thing is like I just don't know if I'll be able to go consistently to the meetings. Um, so just having, if there's anybody else who's interested, I mean that, that's fine. Yeah, right. President of the council. Oh, <laughs> seem to be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I am interested. When are the meetings? Is it a regular? Uh, they are regular, and I should know on the top of my head when they meet. I don't remember. Uh, oh yeah, it's the first Tuesday of the month. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if if that if that works, I mean, I know you also. I, if I if I may, right? Because I know you're also involved in the front. Yeah. Um, right. So does that? I guess my question is like, is that a, is that a conflict? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I'll, I'll say that I don't think it is, but um, I think that that's based on my understanding that the Wood Gallery and the Front are different sorts of organizations in a lot of ways. Um, I'll also mention that I am already on the TW Wood uh, Committee. What is the committee that they have? Um, that helps choose shows and so on. So if that conflict of interest exists, I am already, uh, <laughs> uh, it's already in, in trouble about it. Um, <laughs> it hasn't caused any overt trouble with either organization so far that I have seen. I mean, we're both trying to sell art to the community, so in some way we are in competition. Um, I think that neither organization uh, depends heavily enough on art sales that there is significant actual competition between those two organizations. Okay. And so and until it comes, comes up. Yes. I'm, I'm, um, I'm happy to respond and, to any challenges. And you, um, I guess the other thing is like if it does come up, just yep. you know, recuse yourself yep. when, yep. if it's ever even a question. Yep. So Glenn is going to be the rep, or uh, let's the mayor's designee. That's uh, yes, mayor's designee. Because I don't think I can no, I recuse or not recuse. The same way John designee. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. 
parking. This is going to be a big one this year, so. Um, yes. I'm definitely still into it. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Get parking. <laughs> Unless anybody else wants to. We had two, I think, only because those were the only takers. There's no, we could have a third. I do think, so I will tell you, I mean, obviously, until you really lay out your priorities, but we've challenged our staff to really look at this. I mean, we're going to have a lot of construction. We're going to have you know, possibly a new parking garage. Should we look at expanding that, and, you know, on, on our own as, you know, a partnership, not just counting what we might do with TIF, do we create more parking? Do we, at, when everything's done, there's going to be a reduction in parking spaces in the community. So, uh, you know, I think we really, I think this is personally, I feel as you know, we really have to maybe deal with this. Not maybe, we have to deal with this. I think we have to deal with it kind of head on with some urgencies. So, um, we're already got people flowing on this, uh, unless we're told in May not to. But I think so, all I'm saying is if there are council members interested in this, we're talking this year, so you know, it's going to be probably more than just, you know, I think demand management is an important thing, but I think we're going to have to be looking at real, is it going to be structured, is it going to be a train, is it going to be shuttles, I mean, it's going to have to, it's going to, we're going to be looking towards you know, So I just have a question about it, when I've had some recent conversations with Sue about different stakeholders. Do we have to formalize this committee a little bit more? We called it together short term to, to have an immediate right. working group on looking at some of the things the staff presented to us. But if we're really going to deal with all the, you know, over 300 or more displaced cars during the 219 construction, I feel there need to be major stakeholders there, employers, as well as GMTA, as well as... Um, so we so, agree, and we can reach out to them. Um, oh, we, we had a committee that was established with, that set the state of Vermont. We had Vermont in, in, in the state employees union. We had, um, you know, downtown businesses. We had, you know, GMT was involved. I'm trying to remember who else right, was the, the, the and, and people original parking committee. One by one, people just started dropping off. Uh, and it was left kind of to city staff and folks. So uh, if we're going to be nimble. We need to be able to, to move. I think inviting people to participate would be a great idea. But I, I also think you know, they've got to they've got to show up too. And yeah. that's, that's been a challenge. Um, I can picture uh, because there is a. A, really a finite task that we are looking at um, because of all this you know, the infrastructure changes that are happening. Um, I almost want to think of this as a task force or like a working group um, rather than necessarily a standing committee all right. of the council. And so I could also picture us, you know, as needed saying, you know, hey, Vermont State Employees Union, please come to this meeting. Um, you know, we're not asking for a long-term commitment from right, you. Right, right. Maybe, you know, come to this meeting, see if we need to, if you need to be at this meeting again, and then, so maybe it'll say as So, uh, right, my sense would be this group gets together, so identifies the players that we want to make sure in the loop, and we communicate with them and say, this is going on, we want you to who we are, here's what we're just, here's what we're going to send you, if you want to come, we'll tell you when the meetings are, but these are the issues we're we got really bogged down yeah. with those groups last time. Well, just that the Sustainable Montpelier Co Committee cool. had a transportation group, and there were a lot of good employers there, and many of them expressed interest in just initially a task force to look at the whole picture. Some of them are thinking of shuttles themselves, but we're trying to integrate it and work with it as many resources, public and private. So I'd like to have some initial meetings and, and see what everybody can chip into the pot, so to speak, for funds as well as ideas. Uh, and then you're right, you may need a smaller group. Um, I'm on board with all of that. I just feel like it's something to do. Yep. We need to do it soon. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Do you else want to want in on this, or is it just on and I Great. Ashley might really be interested in this one. Well, 
again, because ultimately, I feel what we set up for this temporary displacement, a lot of it's going to become long term, has the potential. And she's very much, I felt, actually has expressed interest, again, in trying to make things more available to everybody, no matter what your job, day or night, et cetera. <coughs> so. Yeah, so uh, the city has been. Oh, addresses. Looks, yeah, we don't, we don't, um, we're not as uh, compliant with the E911 law as we would like to be. Um, that's going to take a really long time. I mean, Ashley and I uh, were looking into what it would take to get us to that or make progress on that front, and I think we're we're making some progress. I don't know that we need a committee. So, um, I mean, that's something that I mean, she and I were interested in separately, and we can continue to move on that. So I mean, it ultimately came to the council, and the progress process was laid out, and all of that. We do have. We've already got our first conundrum, right? Was we we're looking at this. If we if we move quickly, then we will be talking about 61 Taylor and not one Taylor. Oh, so maybe we should change the name of the project. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can get the committee together. Just yeah, so that's, that's, there you go. But we, but we got special permission to make it one because it right, for the post office the post code. It wasn't. Special. Don't you remember? This was we, a big deal to make it one Taylor I Street. I, I do remember. That oh, yeah. <laughs> you can't take that number away, Bill. <laughs> you got to be in yeah. some of our internal meetings. <laughs> Maybe that's not the first priority for renaming. Well, before people move in. Before people move in. That's true. Better to do it. Oh, I'm, I miss one. There. Thank you. I'll be Back to the original. Funding patron, call it Jeffords Plaza. Or something. <laughs> I just love everybody's signature. Oh, Jack, gosh. that's amazing. I can't read it, but it looks neat. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Did you see it? Okay. Yeah, just circling back, I, I might talk to Sue about a little more about the ADA committee to see if I might be interested in doing that. It seems like something important to have somebody on. <laughs> That's how we roll here. <laughs> okay, so um, I also just want to flag a couple of things. I know this is um, maybe something that we can take up later, um, you know, after we've done some uh, strategic planning amongst ourselves. But uh, a couple other groups that I am interested in, um, I mean, I've been talking about this before, but just thinking about the data that's available to the public from the city, and also, I mean, I, I've been meeting with some city staff recently just about the website and um, just, you know, just all things digital. And so, uh, that may be a group uh, potentially uh, if there's some discrete tasks that we think may be appropriate to invite some other expertise in. I could picture that as being a group that um, maybe we, we want to open up, but I don't want to do that right now. We have some more conversation about that. Um, but uh, I imagine that, that may take that may take some some um, more people power, but we'll see. Um, and then the other uh, group that I I'm not sure if this deserves to be a group, but I a little while ago I had mentioned you know I'm interested in reconsidering some of the art in this room and the the, the pictures out in the hall even. And, and since then you know it's come up like well why you know, why is the bell where it is? And, I don't know what that would take to move the bell, but you know these are conversations we can have, um, and so I can picture that as being a, a group um, potentially. If I don't like I said I don't want to be the the person who's making the decision about uh, well you know this art but not that art. It seems like it should be a group process. Yeah. Well, if this is a group that's about, it sounds like you're talking about the physical plant of this building. Mm. One thing that I'm uh, I've been interested in for many years is looking into what it would take to get uh, get the bell in the tower working again. Well, it's a good question. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So I throw you, that onto okay. the uh, so mission. <laughs> I, can, I can shed some light on that. 
Oh, we can also. We don't have to do it now. Oh, this either. is a funny story. Is it okay? Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, so the bell, as you know, worked and rang on the hour by the number of bells. And we started getting numerous complaints about the mid, particularly the midnight, the 12 bells from downtown residents. They were being quite loud. And it was pretty loud, and so there was that, and so we were having some discussion about what to do about it, and the bell thing kind of rusted and broke. And so the view of the city at the time was, well, that was serendipity, problem solved, and it hasn't rung since, and we don't get any more complaints about the noise. So really, it's I'm sure it's just a question of getting the handle fixed. I don't think it's a major, I mean, I don't know how it costs. It might be some fabrication or whatever, but it's not an insurmountable problem. It was a somewhat conscious decision to not fix it because of the complaints about the noise. So it's something we can talk about. It's something we can talk about. I always used to enjoy having the sort of the mental exercise of trying to keep track of both sets of bells ringing at the same time here in the courthouse. Because <laughs> Precisely. They were quite yeah, I think people that lived down here didn't appreciate that quite as much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. fair, fair. Um, uh, one possibility is that we just, just make that a committee right now. Um, are there people that that would be interested in the internal aesthetics? Yes, one, two. Okay, so maybe the three of us can. Uh, like the, the city hall. Beautification. <laughs> Oh gosh, I'm not sure. Lady Bird Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's called the Bell Committee. Called. Um, okay, what's <laughs> other things? <laughs> yeah. So, um, take the what? The capital cake. That model of the capital is a cake. Oh, it's the top of a cake. What? Yes. I yes. Did not never realize. read the sign next to it. Well, apparently, yeah. I've never read the sign. <laughs> That is worth talking about. We have tried to give that to many people, <laughs> including back to Necky, where it came from. <laughs> well, that's like the school gave you the bell, gave the city the bell. The bell was down at the school, the lobby, for the longest time. The bell actually gets a lot, like, people climb on, it gets, it gets a lot of attention. People yeah. take pictures of it. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, so, yes, go ahead. Uh, not to prolong this ne unnecessarily, but since we mentioned Necky, I, I had a conversation actually earlier this morning uh, about the possibility of having a Montpelier welcoming committee. Um, for example, if a new batch of uh, Necky students comes in or a, a VCFA residency or something, uh, some volunteer or representative of the city could just show up and say, hey, welcome, you know, here's who we are and so on. I don't know if there's any other interest in that, but I thought I'd throw it in. Could we, uh, could we flesh that out a little bit? Could we bring that up another yeah. like? Absolutely. Next time too? Is that yeah. okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's let's talk about that. We've done various. I know the police have occasionally met with them to talk to them about. Yeah, like the parking ban. Routinely, <laughs> yeah, we would meet um, <laughs> the new classes. We they, they would call us Jeez. and. Oh, oh yeah. Hard drill, oh, buddy. Oh yeah. Come up, come up to the thing. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talk about everything from uh, parking, plus some logistical uh, issues there, and, and, and safety, and what the resources are like, and what's available to them. So that um, you know, their model has changed quite a, quite a bit too. So I kind of got away from that. But that used for years and years. That was a standard um, protocol between the department and. So, we have not done that with our culture podcast. Okay. Let's let's talk more about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. I think that's that's it for that. Unless people have other things they want. Yeah. Okay. Um, great. All right. So, uh, council reports. I think last time we started with Donna, if I recall. Right. So let's okay. pass. So council reports is a time when you get to just give us an update on anything happening in the city, or really you can say anything you want. You can well, talk to your constituents, or you can pass. I don't have anything to report, but uh, I do want to say that I know this council went through a very difficult process uh, last week and, uh, <clears throat> and heard from a lot of people, and I appreciate uh, the vote and the support. And I'm, 
since uh, since I was appointed, I've had a number of people that I run into or who, who uh, ask me, well, are you excited? And the answer is yes, I am. And so I appreciate uh, being here and I'm looking forward to it. I have a couple things and in line of just what Jack said, I want to uh, apologize for any confusion and I'm going to read it to make sure I state it right this time, that I may have caused by using the terms that were construed as referring to political parties. My point was that town meeting vote, voting data could be examined differently than just first and second place. Since 487 votes were not cast for Alex, those votes could be understood as votes for positions that differed from Alex. I unfortunately used the term conservative and liberal to describe that difference. It was not my intention to use those words in the political sense. City Council has not and does not characterize itself or its actions according to political party labels, at least not in the four going on five years that I've been here. It has been and will continue to be nonpartisan in all its deliberation. And so I just apologize to this council and to uh, our constituents across the city that that was not clear that when I stated it before and created such a reaction. So forward, I'll be more careful what I say. But I did also want to mention that this week is National Dispatchers Week. And so if you have a chance, you can stop by the police department and say thank you. They would appreciate it. And uh, one other thing. Doesn't matter. I will. I will remember it later. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> All right, I'm uh, still plugging away on my uh, sister city project here. I actually got a pretty big response with some people with strong feelings about what the sister city should be. So with the council's blessing, I would like to maybe convene a little working group to develop a process to get some public input on this and uh, maybe bring it back to the council at some point. Some people have some very meaningful connections with other countries. I think others might just like pasta or something and want to partner with Italy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll flesh it out and come back on that one. Do we have more than one? Yeah. <laughs> Is, I just have a question, I mean, if this is like a working group, does this need to be an official group of the city, or you just want to like have some further conversation? Task force. <laughs> I mean, just go have some coffee, come back, oh toss God. some ideas around. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, first, I want to uh, welcome Jack McCullough to the council. Good to have you here. Uh, and uh, also thank uh, the other applicants to the position and the residents who uh, spoke up. Uh, I'm glad that we had the degree of participation that we did. Um, uh, I also want to say again, and I'm going to say this every uh, council meeting, uh, uh, tomorrow morning, Thursday morning, I will be at Open Hands Cafe in uh, the Episcopal Church Parish Hall from 8.30 to 9.30 and every Thursday. Uh, if anyone has anything they want to talk to me about, that's the time to come in. That's one time. Um, yeah, we talk about all kinds of things. Uh, or nothing. That's what <laughs> uh, And I also want to um, appreciate the fact that we're coming up on Green Up Day. And I'm looking forward to doing that and looking forward to seeing uh, a lot of the city out there. Uh, I usually don't last very long. I get tired really fast, uh, but I will do my best. So, thank you. Great. Um, so, I also want to uh, welcome Jack. Glad to have you. Um, and then, uh, so I just wanted to make a note that I had uh, a meeting today with the uh, investment committee. Uh, I thought it was a, a great meeting. We talked about uh, uh, our options for moving forward with socially responsible um, investing um, practices. So I'm going to be coming back to the council uh, probably pretty soon to have a little bit more of a robust discussion. Um, I think sometime in the near future, the I think we said the 25th, right? That's the hope. That's the hope but um, you know, depending on how full our agenda is. So uh, we we 
may need to weigh in on what what it is that we would like to to see and we'll have some options i think to to um deliberate over so um that's that's it for me uh, just a quick update on the charter change process. I was wondering where our charter changes were, and it seemed like there was a little bit of a snafu in the state house. Um, they didn't get crafted into a bill, and supposedly got sent to Senate GovOps instead of House GovOps. So, but anyways, I, I got uh, Warren and Mary on it. They found it. Things are moving along swimmingly. I actually talked to somebody at Ledge Council just a couple days ago. It's hasn't shown up on the agenda yet if it's not on the agenda for next week you know warren's on the committee i may nudge him a little bit i might just go talk to the chair i have a good relationship with Meta. so anyways no reason to worry at this point um, i would also mention that the community meeting on the uh, non-citizen the possibility of non-citizen voting in city elections has been bumped at the request of a few people. So it's uh, instead of next week, it's going to be Tuesday, May 1st in this room um, at 7 o'clock. And I'm trying to get the word out far and wide about that. John, I had a question about that. Mm -hmm. I can, and I don't know what the law is, but I can imagine that potentially there might be a quorum of this council wanting to attend that meeting. Would that mean that we would have to? Warn that as a public meeting? Boy. Um, I don't think so. I was actually looking at that recently, and there's a specific provision in the cause that, that says that if the if council members are attending another public meeting, mm -hmm. no, it's not theirs. Um, right, and this isn't being called un being under the auspices of the, the council. City. Yeah, It's not being convened for the purpose of council doing business. So well, that's true. It's not business, right? There's not anything. I, I think you were here last week. My recommendation was not to worry about any kind of council action and let the process play out. Um, so that's right. There's no business on the table. So you're not there sure to it's deliberate, fine. deliberate a council. You're there as interested citizens to listen to whatever is being said. Yeah, so I think that would be fine. So I think you're fine. You can double check that, but I'm pretty sure because I was did a lot of digging on the open meeting law this week. So. Um, and this, all of it got, I would brag on myself a little bit. I just pocketed another cert. I'm now a certified network defense architect. <laughs> um, and I just want to thank Bill a lot. He's been very supportive of me doing creative juggling with my own budget, my own departmental budget, and helping out with some of his departmental budget to do a lot of this um, professional development work I've been doing, which has been, it's been getting me a lot of attention. I just got, um, and I hope that reflects well on the city, I just got an invitation from the Center for Technology and Civic Life, one of 14 people who got invited from around the country, a bunch of different states. They're going to fly me to Chicago and put me up and be part of a working group on uh, uh, best practices for modernizing the voter registration process. And just all of a sudden, people are knocking on my door. And I just mm -hmm. really appreciate the, the support that Eddie Miller make that happen. So. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. I'd like to announce that John Odom's new title is Network Ninja. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have many, I don't have much. Actually, just a reminder that we did schedule a tour for next Wednesday night for the Public Works uh, Department and the water treatment plant. Those are both, that's a lot to take in, so just to know. Two members can't attend, so we're going to try to get those two scheduled at a different time together. And then I think we just got something from for the wastewater plant as well, water resource recovery plant in time for that presentation. So. Um, those are coming up at our next meeting. We will be going, um, in addition to DPW, we'll also be talking about TIF and a possible tax stabilization uh, applications. We could have some real um, conversation next week in addition to the committee stuff. So, I'm going to wait for that. That's all I have. Okay. Uh, so, I think that is it. Um, so, without objection. Consider the meeting adjourned. It's not quite 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> cool, right?